What he is doing on the internet is a blatant violation of what the mafia stands for. He was saying, he's a lying rat. He's actually not a lying rat. The person just told the truth. Yeah. That's what you're upset about. Sure. There's one thing about Michael Francis that we can say. He's a very regal, nice guy. Are you Listen, he's a without a doubt. And Berlino isn't. What is the Joey Marlino story? Joey Marlino is the new age Cosa Nostra member, right? His father, his life was decided for him when he was born. His father was a high ranking member of the Philadelphia Mafia in the 70s under a guy, little Nicky Scarfo, one of the most depraved mobsters in the history of the Mafia. His father, his whole life was high ranking. His uncle was also in the Mafia. He cooperated in the 80s. His uncle, Yogi, he cooperated. And Joey, as he was coming up in his 20s, was always around gangsters, his friend group. One thing we have to understand about Philadelphia is South Philadelphia is incredibly small, right? It's a about a 20-block radius as far as the Italian section, and everybody knows everybody. Everybody's related. Joey's friends, the people that are connected to him in that world today, he's been friends with since he was a boy. They've run the streets together. They got in trouble together. They got kicked out of school together. And they've always remained friends. And that's the thing about Joey. And that's why he's become very impenetrable. Because the people that are around him are his dear friends. They've been his dear friends his whole life. And they're never going to waver against each other. Joey ultimately went to prison in the early 2000s. They wanted him on murder stuff. Couldn't get him. Nothing stuck. He gets 14 years. Gets out in the two, early 2010s. Moves what to Florida. Was the 14 years, what was the 14 years for? It was the. Uh, he, he, so they, ha they hit him on uh, murder charges. They didn't stick. One of the issues they had around Joey is none of the witnesses they seemingly believed in court. Okay. They've got, they got a cop, a former cop, to infiltrate the Philadelphia Mafia, a guy, Ron Previty, was around Joey, tried to get Joey to talk about drugs and crimes. Joey was always too smart, never got. Never got to that. Always stay, stay away from drugs. Made money. They hit him on racketeering. He did racketeering stuff, um, loan sharking, gambling, things of that nature. Um, and most of the people in his case, they gave draconian sentences to because they wanted him off the street. One of the guys in his case, a guy, Angelo Lutz, got eight years for bookmaking. Very little things. But they hated him. They wanted him off the street, and they were able to take 14 years of his life from him. Um, he gets out in the mid-2010s, moves to Florida gets re-indicted in 2016 on another case involving the Genovese crime family in New York City. According to the federal government, he was connected with high-ranking people up there. And they had a rat, a guy, John Rubio, that was around Joey every day, trying to get him to talk about things. But the one problem that the government's always had on Joey is they've never been able to connect him to a capital-like crime, murder, attempted murder, something that will put him away forever, large amounts of narcotics. He's too smart. They never get him connected to that. And what they've done is death by a thousand paper cuts. They hit Joey for a year or two, even up to 10 years. But the mafia today, Matt, they don't care about that. They don't care about doing three or four years or, or nickel in the feds. As long as they can kind of continue to maintain their lifestyle, that's all they care about. And Joey, I think at this point is so insulated that it would be really hard to bring an indictment against him unless they get someone to cooperate on the four or five unsolved gangland murders in Philadelphia that continue re to remain uh, unsolved, that there is some very light connection to him with, but no one's come forward. What happened with the, didn't he set up a, an armored truck? Yeah. So Joey I did, that was Joey's first prison sentence in the uh, early nineties. Joey was involved with a armored car robbery where an individual that worked for the armored car company was in cahoots with him in a, a cohort. They were on the high highway. He dropped a bag with about $400,000 in it. They picked it up and Joey was indicted for robbing the armored car. And that's where Joey really gets connected into the present day mafia where he goes to prison. He goes to a place called McKean, which I'm sure you've heard of up in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And he starts palling around with the guy called Ralph Natale. Ralph Natale was a long time member of the Philadelphia crime family. It goes back to Angelo Bruno, which was back into the 50s and 60s. And Joey kind of manipulates Ralph into being the boss. 
Joey, then they both go home and, and Joey kind of takes what he wants. The one issue and the one thing Joey always had was he was kind of the upstart young gun. At that time in Philadelphia, when Joey comes home, there's a guy called uh, John Stanfa. He's the boss of Philadelphia at the time. He came in after Nikki Scarfa went to prison in the late 80s. John Stanfa takes over. John's this old world uh, Sicilian guy. Doesn't kind of agree with the, the, the young guys. They go to war. And Philadelphia goes, there's murders every day in South Philly. Shootings on expressways. Um, people getting capped in front of their families. Shooting into people's homes. It was a wild west in the early 90s. Um, but yeah, the armored car robbery was the first pinch Joey took. What, what was the one where was it Joey that that did shot someone with like a Mac Ten or a Mac? Or- that's that, that's something that I've yet to talk about on my channel due to the fact that I think there's one thing that I try to do is if it is only an alleged crime or there's no proof that it ever happened and that person was involved, I tend to not bring it up. But that's something that's arised from people believe. That in the late 80s, early 90s, it was, I think, Halloween of 90, I forget the year. Nikki Scarfo had a son, Nikki Jr. Nikki Jr. was in the streets. Um, people were unhappy with him in Philadelphia. He tries to go to the Lucchese crime family in New York City for kind of a uh, safe haven. His father was in prison. He really had no friends in the family at that point. He's sitting at dinner one night. A masked guy with a Jason mask or a scream mask or something comes in with a Mac 10 and shoots Nikki Jr. and walks out. There are people that believe, feds, a lot of them believe that Joey Molino is the gunman that night. There's no proof behind it. It's an old kind of historical wise tale, if you will, but we don't have any proof of it. He was never brought under anything on it. Um, and we have no idea if he was involved or not. Okay. And then the case where he went to a uh, federal prison recently. Yeah. What? So Joey actually was one of the few people in 2016, every person in that case, I think there was about 40 individuals from the Genovese crime family, a few others, everyone pled in that case. They got short sentences, you know, one to 10 years. Joey decides to fight the case, beats the feds which is very difficult to do. He beats the feds again. So Joey's kind of developing this. I mean, he did go to prison for a period of time, but he's continuing to maintain that they're not getting him on the really serious things. And a lot of these cases are popcorn headline cases. They just want Joey in the paper and they want to take him off the street for a couple of years. They then bring another nonsense case several months after involving Joey gambling through his phone on apps which most of America does, and it's perfectly legal. But they were so butthurt that Joey beat them in the Fed case that they say to him, look, we got you dead to rights. We know you're gambling and not paying taxes on it. What do you want to do here? So he pleads. They give him two years for a thing everyone does. He goes to jail. I think he did around a year, and he's been out ever since. He's been out since... I think it was 2018. So he's been out about five years now. And now the thought is, is Joey Molino still in the life or not? Is he still a mobster? Is he still the boss of Philadelphia? Right. But I think that, I think the kind of interesting thing about the whole show that he has is what he is doing on the internet is a blatant violation of what the mafia stands for. Right. Right. In the seventies and eighties, like his, this would be unheard of to people like his father, right? Right. You know, his boss, like it's just unheard of. But I think this is where the mafia has changed so much. There was an article in Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago where an old bo- boss in New York said that in 20 years, he didn't believe the mafia would be around because people like his son and grandson are the next ones in line and they're not capable of not being on the phone all the time. You know, they're, they're doing hits through TikTok. You know, they're talking through right. Snapchat. And I think that's the real issue nowadays. The old adage of why be a gangster if nobody knows who you are is really pervasive, not only in Italian-American organized crime, but in the rap world. I mean, how many rappers have been jammed up through song lyrics, being on Instagram? Um, the old way of being secret, make money, not headlines 
even has gotten into the mafia where, you know, we don't, we can't just be, Hey, you know, on the street doing things. But I think Joey's always been like this. I remember in 1996, Joey would call into radio stations and, and talk about his relationship with athletes and stuff. Joey's always been very personable, very out there. And I think this is really Joey just being Joey. And I think a lot of the people around him just know that. Is he still getting money kicked up to him? I have no idea. Um, I think the age old question with Joey is how does he maintain the lifestyle that he has without a gainful employment? I think that's really always the question. I mean, I'm sure you've noticed it. Joey wears Louis Vuitton in every show he does. Right. How, how does, I think the government would ask, how does, how, like, how does he do that? Um, but he'll just probably say, well, my friends give me money. It's not illegal, I guess. Based on reading the comments in my video mm -hmm. that I did with Wade, you know, all these guys think he's filthy rich. And, you know, the truth is that the guys that I know say he's not, that he's not, that he's just not rich. He doesn't think, have a lot of money. I, I think if you know Joey, and, and this is something that this goes back to his early kind of life connected to that world. Joey loves to gamble, right? Most John Gotti made a, a shit ton of money, but he had a gambling problem, man. And and that's in that world, you buy so many things. It's like it for, for most people getting a hundred thousand a week, that's a lot of money. But if you're spending two hundred thousand, it's not that much, right? It's right. I, I think people have to realize look, I don't know what Joey's financials are, but I think that's I think where maybe he gets the government stuff coming from is that. Where does he make his money from? Like, where is that coming from? How does he support a lifestyle the way he has it? Um, I don't know what his financials are. Do I think he's filthy rich? I have no idea. I don't believe he is, but um, hey, maybe he has some rich friends and they just like to hang around him. I do know, and this is this is inside information. I know an individual, I'm not gonna say his name, but I have heard about an individual that just wanted to hang around him and paid him money. So yeah. I, it, it's he is very well loved in a certain area in Philadelphia and people, most people don't like mob informants and Joey speaks out against them. He has his way of doing things. They have their way of doing theirs. Both sides are going to make money. Michael's going to make money. Joey's going to make money. They're all going to make money. Uh, and they all, I think need each other to survive. I think at this point, but yeah, people love Joey and, and, and they'll pay money to hang around them. And, there's nothing illegal about that. I mean, do you think Jay-Z ever pays for a meal when he goes out? No. No. That's just how it is when you become somewhat famous, you know? Right. Do you know um, Gene Borello's – it is Gene – it's Borello, right? Yeah. Do you know what his story is? Yeah. So Gene was uh, was another guy who you know came up in a very fertile area for the mafia, a place called Howard Beach. Um, Gene's extended family were involved with the Gambino crime family, a guy, Andy Ruggiano. He was a high ranking capo. I think he's one of the most influential people in the history of the family. He was that dialed in. Um, Gene came up in a mob run area in the eighties, um, started piling around with certain guys who were connected as well in that world. Howard Beach is mob territory. That's where John Gotti lived. That's where Joe Messino lived. A lot of big mobsters lived there. It's always been controlled by the mafia. Uh, Gene started running around with a guy called Ronnie G. Alonzo. He was a little older than him. He was a capo in the family. His uncle was, was a capo. And Gene started doing work for the mafia. He was doing home invasions. He was beating debtors up. Um, he was doing anything he had to do to survive. And his goal, I think, long term was to follow in the footsteps of his family. He wanted to be a mobster. He wanted to get made. Uh, and Gene, I think in layman's terms, let's say you owed 10 grand and you weren't paying, Gene had steps to collect the money. And uh, Gene was doing arsons for people. Uh, Gene was lighting cars on fire. Gene was uh, doing bank robberies. Um, there's actually a really interesting story. Gene was doing work for this guy, Vinny Asaro, this old mob guy, probably in his 70s at that time. This mob guy's driving one time, I think it was around 2015, in Howard Beach, a motorist cuts him off. He doesn't do anything, just takes the guy's license plate down. Through a contact he had in the streets, he got the individual's location. He instructed Gene and two other people to go take care of this guy. 
So Gene and the guy, they go to the, the guy's house, light the guy's Mercedes on fire. And in turn, a cop sees this happen and chases them through Howard Beach. Um, so those are the kind of things Gene was doing. He was beating people to the point where they were shitting themselves, um, just doing some really depraved things. Um, he got to the point where they were all indicted and, and Gene decided to cooperate against his superiors. And I'm sure you'll ask me, what's the connection between Joey and Merlino? There is none. They didn't know each other. Uh, Joey will right. tell you that. Joey actually never even mentioned Gene as far as I know. Um, but Gene is a guy who I think is very proud of who he is, regardless of whether he's a good guy or not. Um, Gene's a bad boy. He always looks at himself as that. He gets under people's skin. People, You think people hate you? People hate <laughs> him. Like, And I find him very mm. compelling because – whether or not I personally like him, he's really interesting. He has a lot of interesting stories. Um, and he constantly reoffends. So Gene is a guy who cooperated, but has been back to prison multiple times since then. I think, as you know, Gene just got yeah. out about a month or two ago uh, from doing a seven month bid. So Gene has not learned from anything. Gene has done a lot of things that I don't think he's proud of, but he's a compelling guy and people want to hear from him. I mean, he's, he's honest about it though. You know, he's not like, he's like, that didn't happen or you don't understand what happened. Like, I always love the guys that, you know, which is like we were talking about earlier, like the, you know, where they, they, they paint themselves as being the hero yeah. in this. Yeah. I cooperated, but the only reason I cooperated is because of this and this and look, that's, well, you yeah, know, Matt, that's fine. I think like, those are the people on my channel. I I've never interviewed John A. Light. I, I don't know that I ever will. Um, I don't want to interview people that are not contrite about what they've done. I've spoken to people that, I mean, I think Gene, if, if you go to Howard Beach and ask the kids that grew up in the 2000s about feared people, he was definitely around feared people. Gene was around very high ranking people. That's just the truth, no matter if you like him or not. And he has an interesting story that people want to hear. But I've always found Gene to be pretty contrite. He's never said, I'm not this, I'm not that. I did what I did. I always ask Gene, you know, why did you ever cooperate anyway? Because you've been to prison multiple times since then. Didn't seem like it made a lot of sense. I still think Gene thinks he's a gangster. I think he still believes that, you know, if the rubber meets the road, I think he could probably still handle himself. We've seen him call out people. Uh, we've called, yeah. called Joey. Gene is just a lunatic. That's just who he is. Um. And then he relocated to to like Tampa or St. Pete. He's in, I think he's in St. Pete. Yeah. And he, what he's done there is he's kind of tried to create a life for himself. They have tried to say, the federal government has tried to bring charges against him that he's still committing crimes there. Um, I think the thing about Gene, and I'm, I know you know this, the federal system is all about the judge you get. The judge is your judge, jury, and executioner. Yeah. It really is. They could either give you this or that. And that's why like an SPF it's all about the judge, right? It doesn't really matter what the prosecutor says. They decide. And Gene had a really good judge, a guy, Judge Block, who is very sympathetic to criminals. Uh, and Judge Block gave Gene a long leash and said, you know, we're going to put up with certain things. And I think that's one of the things that in the mob community, a lot of people are, are kind of irritated with is some of the guys that are in this world taunt people to the point of, well, I'm protected by the government. You can't do anything. And I think people believe, I told Gene, I think you should be in prison. I think you're a detriment to society. I think you're a guy who has not learned from your crimes. And I think if Gene had a different judge, he'd probably still be in prison. Um, How much time did he do on that Gene, first? Gene did about part. seven months. Um, but this goes back years with Gene. Gene, oh, okay. Gene used to contact uh, his ex-girlfriend's husband and say he was going to blow their house up. I mean, all sorts of stuff. Um, but you look at case in point, there's a guy, Frank Pasqua. He's a, a mob guy who's been on YouTube. He's with the Lucchese family, knows Gene very well. Frank's doing seven years on a crime. He got a different judge than Gene. So it's it really comes down, Gene really, and Gene will tell you, Judge Block is his savior because without Judge Block, Gene would be in prison right now, and he'd probably be doing several more years. And that's why I said, why'd you cooperate? You're, you've are you been in prison like off and on since you cooperated. So, um, and, and you know, eventually the people Gene cooperated with, they're going to get out of prison. So it's, it's all very interesting, um, but I don't think Gene gives a shit. Gene just lives his life, and now he, he he's one of these people, Matt, that you can't – I can give him my advice on what I would do. 
but Gene ultimately has no control, right? I tell him, bro, I wouldn't post those videos, man. You look really bad, but he doesn't, he won't acknowledge, like if someone talks about me, I'll just ignore them. He doesn't live like that. It's I'm going to attack them. I'm going to say, I'm going to, you know, do this and do that. So he's a wild card for sure. Um, didn't he start an, I heard something about him. He had started a, I guess a podcast with he and a John a light, right? Yeah. So he, had, they had a show called the Johnny and Gene show. It was quite popular. Um, we actually, f- Gene came out of the shadows on John's first, I believe Vlad TV interview. They interviewed Gene for about 10 or 15 minutes and Gene and John are from the same area. Ozone Park, Woodhaven, Howard Beach, Queens. And John Aylett was originally connected to the Gambino family. He knew Gene's uh, extended family that were connected. And weirdly enough with Gene, he didn't end up going towards the Gambinos. He went toward another group, the Bonanno crime family. So they always kind of knew each other. I think they knew people, each, knew uh, similar people. And yeah, they did a show. But that's where Gene's problems came from because one of Gene's requirements was he was not allowed to be on the internet do, uh, talking about his crimes. And he's on there saying all sorts of different stuff. And I believe one of his supervisor release requirements was he was told not to do that. And that sure ran into a lot of problems because they started interviewing other people who started to violate their supervisor release. Um, and the show just kind of went kaput. Um but yes, they did have a show originally. I think the one thing, Matt, that I would tell anyone listening to this is a lot of people in this genre believe that because you cooperate, you're not a tough guy anymore. And I think that's super far from the truth. Like people like Gene and John A. Light, like there's Sammy Gravano. They're still really bad people who did a lot of bad shit. Right. And I think that's the question of why we do deals with people like that. Like, why do we do deals with them? Like, think of what cooperation is. You're telling on someone else because they hate that person more than you, in a a sense, right? So, like, Sammy Gravano got a deal. Even though he was involved with 19 murders and probably dozens more, the government said, we hate you, but we hate that guy, John Gotti, more than you. So, we're going to forgive all your crimes and we're going to insert you back to society. We're not going to tell anyone. We're going to just let you live your life. How? How does that work? I asked the judge that did that deal, John Gleason. I talked to him and I interviewed him and I said, why did you do that deal? Does that, have, does that seem American to you? And he said, well, we felt it was a better deal to make because the guy above him was a lot more ruthless than he was. And that's how they justify it. But these are still bad people. And, and we have to remember, just because they cooperate doesn't mean they're not tough anymore. So Yeah, I was going to say, like it was, I had mentioned that with uh, the Joey uh, Merlino where they were, he was, you know, they were going back and forth. And when, when I talked to Wade, he was like, Oh, I could see Merlino, you know, approaching him or, you know, confronting Gene. I was like, I listen, I've stood, I've sat at a table and stood side by side, uh, um, next to Merlino. He is not a big guy, but, but I think, and, but I think he, Matt, here, here's the thing. And, and this is what I don't think people realize is that there are sycophants of these people, right? They're in the comment sections here. That yes, that may do something. Correct, and I think that's right. where like there are guys. There's a guy, Philip Leonetti. He was a gangster in Philadelphia. He was Nicky Scarfo's nephew. He cooperated against Nicky. He's lived in secrecy for years. Won't show his face on camera, Be- even though his uncle's dead. He's still concerned that people will come after him. And I think that's the thought. I don't. Joey, I don't think seemingly down the road. I think if you ask him, he doesn't give a flying shit about Gene Barello. He does what he has to do. He laughs, they talk, that's whatever. But he wouldn't, I think it would just be people that would do it. Like, I don't think they would be instructed to do anything. And I don't th- I think if Joey was in public and Gene walked up, it wouldn't be Joey fighting, I don't think. Uh, it would be, you know, people with Joey, you know. But I don't think it's going to matter. I think Joey. I think he's moved on from it. I don't think he's going to mention it again. I don't know why he mentioned it to begin with because they didn't know each other really. No, he he had mentioned it in one of the episodes where he mentioned something, but he, he was, oh, that that other rat lives down there uh, in Tampa. And too, that's going to set Gene off. It just is. Right. Like, and, and, right. and that's what I've tried. Like, I know Snuff is cause. I've known Snuff for years. You know, I've known him since we were young. And 
he knows that, you know, like Gene is just a lunatic and he's just going to jump out and say stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and that's how he's found a way to stay relevant, you know? And so, okay. I was, I was going to say, I hate to cut you off, no, but I was going to say, so, um, so snuff, you said his name's snuff. Well, his name's Joe Perry, yeah. but they call him little snuff. Um, okay. he, that's how did he, how does he end up playing into this whole yeah. thing? Like how's he end up being his Joey's co-host? So Joe Perry is someone that I would say is, do you know what the word bun vivant means? No. A bun vivant is like a, a person who everybody knows, right? And a lot of the time in little communities like South Philly, there are these characters that, that arise. Joe Perry has a father who's just as big a character as he is. They've been in South Philly their whole life. They lived in the Italian market. And Joe Jr., the, the, the kid that you see, is a kid that everybody likes. He, he's well-respected. People enjoy him. He's not connected to the mafia, as far as I know. Just a regular guy. He's married. He's got a regular job. And he knows a little bit about sports. And Joey knows his father, comfortable with the kid. And they approached him, I think, essentially, and said, listen, you're clean. We know you're a good host. We want you to work with us. And Joey's comfortable with him. And they feel like they have a good rapport together. But he's just a guy from South Philly people know. You know, if he, if he weren't from South Philly, you wouldn't know who he is. But – there he works and the show is very based on food and, and, and the kind of that culture there. And that culture is so different than really, I think anywhere, even New York, like it's significantly different. Uh, and Joe Perry is, I think when you look up the word South Philly, the word South Philly, he would be right there. He is a stone cold kid from that a neighborhood. Well, where are they doing the show in Philly or in? No. So a lot of the time, uh, Perry, uh, Joe Perry flies to Boca where okay. Joey is and they film the show. Sometimes Joey will fly up and they'll do the show in, in a, in a cafe in South Philly or yeah, they're all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the time they'll do it in Florida, but uh, yeah, they do it once a week and, and you know, they found a way to, I think do some good. And I think deep down to me, I think Joey is a guy who has spent a lot of his adult life in prison. And I think he, he's looking at it and saying, listen, I'm 60 plus years old. Now I have a wife kids that are grown. I got to try to spend the last 20 years of my life doing something kind of enjoyable, you know? And I think for Joey, like, I don't know why he wouldn't take it seriously because Joey can, Joey can make money doing this. He just can, you know, I know the company offered him money up front. He, he can, if he does it the right way, exactly. but so far you're alienated. Like all the, th the, o the only thing that makes you relevant or makes him relevant, he is, dismantling and you know ruining it for well, my himself. question is when does that when that runs out then what do you do right right well, then you turn around and you want to talk to mafia guys that ain't gonna happen right so they're not gonna talk to you so and he's not and gonna ever not talk about his own crimes so i think i think you and and that's one of like I, again i don't run the show but if i did mm -hmm. that that would be one of the things i would have presented and said listen maybe we tell a story once in a while but the crux of this show should be a lifestyle show where we're interviewing people every week. We're interviewing, you know, really because Joey knows a lot of people. I mean, it, it's it's something that could have worked. And I'm not saying that it won't work. I think they do pretty well with it. But it's I think I think you're putting yourself into a corner where at some point, you know, this you're typecasting on what your show is. And I know through some of the people that I know in the mob world, Joey is. I think trying to kowtow to a certain base of people that are real low lowlifes. I'm talking about right. the, these people that support criminals, mafia people. They hate rats. That is a most of America, Matt, does not think like that. They just don't. Yeah. They don't right. want those people near them. They they don't want to be around them. Um, and I think you're kowtowing to a base of people that is just real low lowlifes. Well, you you already got a. Look, the the mobster genre, as you said, it's already small. Yes, it is. And now you're taking a segment of that, and you're taking it. it you're you're now taking a, a sub segment of a small um, Matt, genre you know, to you, begin with. You know my most viewed videos. You know what they're 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 about. What they're interviews of me interviewing informants. Most people don't care. They and, and without yeah. informants, we wouldn't have these stories. Now I've challenged. I get calls all the time from people in that world. 
I'm sick of what Gene's saying. I'm sick of what Dom Sakali's saying. I'm sick of what Michael's saying. I said, okay, so-and-so, come on the show and let's discuss it. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, well, Just then shut up. Then you have to accept what they're saying. Right. That's my problem. Like, I get emails every day from people. Hey, I want to say that. Okay, come on the air and let's talk about it. No, no, I can't. And it's like, well, what do you want me to do then, bro? I can't right. say an anonymous source from Queens told me this. Either you want to talk or you don't. And, and that's the challenge we have. That's why those people are the ones that are out there talking about it because they're the only ones willing to. So I was going to say somebody came on in the comment section and it it was – I, it, I I thought it was Perry, right, in my comment section, mm -hmm. but um, Wade said I don't think so because the guy had like four subscribers on the channel that he. Oh, you you're know, saying someone came in and you thought it was their show? Yes. So I thought so in the comment section on Wade and I's video, there was a, a comment that was left by a guy, and I thought it was Perry because the guy because I knew it wasn't Joe uh, Joey because Joey's not going to go in the comment section mm -hmm. on somebody else's. Yeah. Video. And basically what the guy said was, um, wow, here's another looks like a couple of other guys uh, trying to trying to get views based on our content. I think I saw that. And you said, well, yeah, that's kind of the point of YouTube. Right. And yeah. And I was like, I guess you're not understanding yeah, how I've, this works. Like one thing you have to realize, Matt, and, and this is something that that as a seasoned mob gu mob tube guy, I've, I've been in it for right. the whole time. This genre defies anything like what you would think is normal is not normal. It's just like people in this world have no understanding of anything. Like they, they are all delusional. They all live in a world where it's just, it's crazy. I can't even explain it. You have people that are just complete lunatics. Well, it, it's, it's, you've got, so you're telling me that you've got some guy who sells insurance and has two kids and a wife and he's watching videos and admiring someone who's in the mob who murders people who extorts hardworking regular citizens and this is a guy that like like this is a guy who's raising two kids and has a normal wife like that's not possible the the, the types of people that are rooting for someone like like Joey Marli Merlino is somebody who's Mo's yards or something. Someone who's uh, like they're they're think, they're they've got drug problems. They're yeah, these are the, these are the guy who's in and out of prison. Like it can't be a regular middle class American citizen. Yeah, I'm can't be rooting for that. because I yeah I, I I've had people say to me like on TikTok, oh you are an apologist for the mafia and look I think that there was a day where the mafia was like there are certain people in that world you know in the seventies and eighties. They're regal. I mean, they just were. I mean, seeing John Gotti walk down the street, I mean, the guy just exuded like the mob ethos. But the mob today are complete low lives, like complete low right. lives. They, they're. I was telling somebody that it, they're basically like it's, it's basically a, a street gang. They're yeah. they're almost like a street gang. They're miscreants. They're people that um you know, and most of the old guys that were involved with the mob are so old now that they're not doing nothing in the streets, and it's just the rest mm -hmm. of the scraps. Mm -hmm. I think. But, but but I but I always say to those people, you know, I think ten years ago I would have I would have rooted for someone like Merlino or or, or I I didn't like rats, but you know, Matt, I really believed once I once my dad died a couple of months ago, I, I really truly saw the light that those are, my dad's the type of person I should be celebrated. You know, your dad, you know, the people that you know, the people out front of my house right now digging ditches and building roads and guys that go to war and, and, and will put their, you know, doctors, you know, uh, people like that are, are here. Middle, middle class yeah. America that, yeah. that makes this country run. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. My wife and I went to a party the other day Yeah. for someone that it was, it was a Christmas party and it was in Plant City, which is uh, an area of uh, outside uh, Tampa. I mean, it's his own city, so, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not far. It's 45 minutes to an hour from, let's say, Tampa. And the woman got up, and, and I've always had an issue with this chick. She got up in front of whatever it was, 30 or 40 people, and she spent five minutes telling us how wonderful her life was. 
and how she was doing great and super successful and what a great year she'd had and how thankful she was and how she'd just gotten a new Maserati. And then she started joking about how embarrassed she was that she had to hold that the place, the venue that she had scheduled had been, gotten flooded or something and it was on the beach and it was in this nice hotel and how she at the last minute had to scramble to find this this room so she could have this party and that she stopped to get gas and down the road before she got there and that this guy in a pickup truck and Plant City couldn't pronounce the name of the car she was driving. And she kind of just did this whole ha ha ha, like, oh my Lord, I can't believe we're here in Plant City and started kind of making this mocking thing. And I looked over at like, I already don't like this broad, bro. And I looked over at my wife and she looked at me and she was like, I know, I know. And I was like, you mean you're making fun of the people that feed you that deliver your your groceries and all of the the everything that you're wearing right now the the middle class america that makes this country run that give you the privilege of being able to make money and buy an imported car you know all of everything you have is based on on the backs of those people and you're in their town mocking them you know, you should be ashamed but I think of yourself. Goes and back I, to the delusions that you we talked about earlier in this country, where everything is about how I want it when I want it, and I better get it now. And if you don't like it, go fuck yourself. You know, well, no, like there's a lot of people that like worked hard to get that venue open that day. You know, and and now, but people are pretentious, man. They just are. And, and th- these people that root and watch this stuff. Um, Look, I get like rooting for villains. Like that's been going on forever, right? The mafia. Everybody, everybody loves Catch Me If You Can. Everybody sure. likes, you know, even 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 in the movie Heat. Yeah, I'm dying for De Niro to get away. Sure, but it's but it's a film, right? It's a movie. Right. This well, is, I understand, but he's still a horrific character. Sure, I'm still rooting for him. Sure, I mean Tony Soprano was a bad guy. Right. People loved him though, right? But it's all film and TV. This is real life where. And what I find really concerning is the people that are saying these things in the comment sections of these videos are are grown men, you know, in their fifties, sixties. You know, they have grandchildren, you know, and they're the rat this, rat that, you know. And it's like, first of all, if you were facing twenty years, you don't know what yeah. the hell it is you do. It's easy to say, oh, I wouldn't say nothing, and I'd go to jail. And it's like, well, yeah, but what if the guy that you're going to jail for is fucking your wife? taking all your money, all your businesses, and you got to sit there and just deal with it. And that's why like every person that you speak to, you try to take what they did with a grain of salt because you don't really know, you know, like sometimes these people kill people's family members. You're going to, you're going to go to jail for them. Did you ever, did you ever see the interview I did with big Herc? No, I I, I have to see that. No. (laughs) Oh, fuck. God, bro. Talk about something gone wrong. Oh, wow. Really? We're sitting there. Like, first of all, <laughs> I when I appro- I sent him a, a, an email. Hey, man, I'm going to be in. So, so you know, be I, I was uh, I'm going to be in L.A. And here's the different podcasts I've been on. Didn't know if you knew my story. and If you were interested, I am going to be in L.A. Mm-hmm. And I was on a uh, soft white underbelly. So I'm going to be in the area. And I'm supposed to be on another uh, show, too. Right. And he came back and he said, bro, I do know your story and I'd love to have you on. Cool. So I go get my hotel room, him and his, he and his cameraman show up and I start telling him my story. And so we get through the whole story, blah, you know, we get all the way through it pretty quickly, right? Maybe within 45 minutes to an hour, I'm about to, I'm being arrested, which is a pretty quick, well, it's a decent, it's a decent telling of my story. and. When I get to my lawyer saying, you know, listen, you, your only choice is to cooperate. He kind of, his face, you know, he like, he couldn't believe it. And I remember right then I thought, he doesn't, oh, you don't know my story. Like, (laughs) like, you don't like, oh man. And I thought to myself for a split second, I thought, you know what you can do right now? You can breeze over this. Very quickly, you can say, you know, so bo- basically, 
you know, I ended up taking a plea. I ended up doing 13 years. Um, I got out a few months ago and he would have been okay with that. He was happy with the version of my story I'd already given the shorter version of 45 minutes to an hour. He was okay with that because I've seen his videos. They're not two, three hours long. Mm -hmm. They're 45 minutes to an hour. But I thought, you know, you just don't get to cooperate and not own up to it. And I'm dying to know what this guy's going to do. Like, what's he going to say? Because that face tells me he's going to have a problem with this. So I went, oh, no, bro. I said, it gets worse. I said, I, I said, and I, I said, I'd love to tell you that I didn't cooperate. I said, but I did. I said, but I did. I said, listen, I said, I tried to cut the throat of every single fucking person I'd ever. I mean, I just went in hard the whole way. And he was infuriated. We start going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then at one point, I'm, I'm like, why wouldn't I cooperate? These people had cooperated against me. You know, I'm, we're going back and forth. And he says, um, I said, what? You mean? He said, well, because, you know, the code, I go, code? What code? There's no code. <laughs> and I started, like, mocking the code. And then he said something about, he said, well, you know, I, I wouldn't do that. You know, I got integrity. I said, integrity? I said, bro, I said, you're robbing, you're robbing banks with a gun. You're putting people on the ground. You're sticking a gun in people's, right. in, in people's There's faces. There's no integrity. Normal people's faces. Mm -hmm. I said, um, I said, listen, I, but, you know, like criminals don't have integrity. You can't say I have integrity. If you had integrity, you'd be working two jobs sure. to make a lip to, to feed your kids. Not saying I'm going to go out and rob a bank to feed my kids. Well, there's a guy, Um, you, you should probably speak to him. There's a guy, I actually mentioned him earlier. Um, There's a guy, Anthony Ruggiano. His father was a really high ranking Gambino crime family capo. And he, he, he talked about that when I spoke to him about his father would never sell drugs. And he'd always say to his dad, you can make a couple hundred thousand just big a phone call. And he would say, well, yeah, but I, we have integrity, essentially. And he goes, integrity, you're a fucking murderer. Like, what are you talking right. about? And when he talked about cooperating, he, he almost said that in a way where, like, everybody talks about integrity. But, you know, when it's time to really be in full of integrity in the end you don't have it as you said he's sticking people up with a gun and robbing banks you know women that are just trying to survive probably have kids at home and they're going to deal with some guy with a mask coming in and robbing their bank or you're shaking down a store owner your oh, people throw, right. i'm going to set your place on fire knock out your windows beat up your employees you know stop people from coming in here like this is a hardworking American citizen. You're threatening them. You're making them pay you four hundred dollars a week. But I think my thing, thing, Matt, is like I get, I get. There's like a criminal maybe out there that like doesn't like rats because without rats they may not be in jail. But it's when you look at every mob case, John Gotti didn't go to prison because of Sammy Gravano. They had John Gotti dead to rights. That's why he went to prison. It's as simple. As simple as that. Just like with Big Herc. I don't know Big Herc's story, but I'm gonna guess that. He went to jail because he robbed banks. It's not because someone cooperated against him, right? When the well, feds bring a case against you, they have it, man. Two of his two of his co defendants cooperated because they grabbed all of them. But the bottom line is, if you're done, you're done. And, and the, when the you, real when you, is have you probably said you didn't get to cooperate first. When they have a cooperator in a case, right, like in a mob case, it's just to sure the case up. Right. Do you think they go into that case strictly with if we don't have good testimony from this guy? We're not going to convict this guy. They have the no, they dead had, to rights. They have they the had tapes. They had everything. Yeah, they have the good. They have the wiretaps. They have the surveillance. They have the the, the the you saying things like when the case is brought to you by the feds, they don't they, they don't not bring it, man. You know, and, and right. But but my whole thing is that most of the people in these comment sections are like middle America people, like that that have some goofy phony code that like I don't really know where it comes from, like. uh well, it, here's the problem. Most, most cases are solved or are furthered by cooperation. Okay. So most of them have some kind of cooperation. 90 something percent of all federal cases have cooperated or people cooperated. So but in the world that I'm in this mob stuff, right? It ain't strictly cooperators, man. Like, no, no, I'm not saying, I, I'm saying, I, I understand you're saying, no, they've got wiretaps. Yeah. They've got, you know, I, I understand that. But what I'm saying is that in general, 
because they, they don't just hate mob cooperators. They hate all cooperators. Yeah. They hate all rats. The p- point is, is that let's pretend for a second that you couldn't use any cooperation. People couldn't cooperate against each other. Let's say everybody didn't cooperate. That is not a world that anybody could survive. No. I get because the saying. bottom line is I could go in, kick in your fucking house, execute you, steal everything you have in front of your neighbors, and they wouldn't tell. Nobody would tell. Nobody would cooperate. Well, the only places Nobody. that that's accepted in society, those places are complete hellscapes, right? They're, they're neighborhoods right. where they don't solve any murders. There's murders every day. You're, you're right. It's not a society we can live in. In fact, we need people to cooperate. The problem that I have is, is these people that – just generalize, oh, he ratted. You know, it's like, well, yeah, but do you know the fucking story? Do you know why he did it? Do you know what happened? Do you know the particulars behind it? It's it's generalizing. It's if I was a part of a scheme that stole your your mother's four hundred thousand or million dollar right. retirement fund, you'd be begging me to cooperate to try and get some of that back. I've had people call me a rat because I talk about mob stuff and I and, and I try to say. First of all, you also cannot be a rat if you're not a criminal. You just can't. If, right. if I see someone across the street robbing their house and I see blind as they who it is, and the police come to me and say, hey, who did that? And I tell them, I'm not a rat. Yeah, right? I'm a normal person. Right. right. If someone robs my home, I mean, I'm going to probably defend myself. But if the cops come to me, I'm going to say, I saw who it was. This is what they look like. In certain circumstances, people would say, I'm a rat. You can't be a rat if you're not in the streets. Okay. Right. You just can't. But you're right. If someone's stealing money from my grandmother, I of course I want someone to say something. What the what right. society could live like that? Well, I mean, but th- these are guys that they they don't think these aren't that nobody. You never meet anybody who's really a sharp, sharp guy who's su- a successful, sharp person that really under thinks about it and goes. And what's even funnier is that. Every ninety five percent of the time, when I say something back to these guys, they back down immediately. And you know better than me, man. Like th- this whole rat culture, man. It's like, for instance, when I was young, Fifty Cent was one of the biggest rappers in the world, right? He's tough. He's from the streets. He's a shooter. He's a drug. You know all that stuff. Do you know who Fifty Cent just recently did a podcast with? The Flores twins, two rats that cooperated yeah. against El Chapo. When it comes yeah. to making money. Nobody cares about that shit. Yeah. It's business. And I t- tell you right now, you go into any fucking boardroom in America, nobody cares. Why do you think Sammy Gravano and Michael Frenzies are the biggest channels in this genre? Because nobody cares. John and Joe Q public don't care that Sammy Gravano ratted out some scumbag mobster in Brooklyn. Nobody cares. Nobody, nobody cares. Trust me. I, I, listen, it, it, look, there. I saw a TikTok couple months ago and they said look if you're watching all my content and and you're you're commenting even if you're even if everything you're saying is negative you, you're a fan that's why this that's why the world you're in I'm the world you're in and I'm in is so great because what job can you have where if if you hate someone's um steak right you're just not going to go to the restaurant right right but in this genre you can truly make money even with people that hate you it's the most interesting thing in the world, right? Like hate watch. I always say like hate views. Like, if you hate me and watch the vid- view, it counts the same as if you love me, right? I got, listen, Wes Watson. I did a, I did a, oh, a yeah. video on Wes Watson. Yeah. Okay. Guess what? It's 95% absolute hatred against me and my co-host who basically kind of did a mocking Wes Watson um, video. And the truth is, I don't even hate Wes Watson. I, I think a lot of what he says, I don't like his delivery, but he's got some good advice. Maybe not all of it, but a lot of it. But, you know, the the point is, is that it, it doesn't matter that it's all hatred. The algorithm, thumbs down or thumbs up. It's just interaction. It doesn't matter. Also, it's just pumping my video. M- most of the really popular, whether it's YouTubers, TikTokers, even entertainers, people hate, right? Yeah. Like Howard Stern didn't become really popular because everyone loved it. He had a lot of really dedicated fans, but a lot of the group that listened to him didn't like him, right, at all. Right. My old boss, Dave Portnoy, people hate, like hate him, like truly hate him. Right. They're 500, 600 million dollars, right? And he's made a living off of that, like people hating him. If you people don't hate you, you're not interesting. You just aren't. 
I mean, these people that play it down the middle and everybody loves them, they're all nice. That's not interesting. Look at Joey. Joey's not stupid. He knows. When I talk about Phil Leonetti or Gene Barello or Sonny Franzese, that's going to move more views than me talking about Schfoyadel and what pasta I had last night and if the Chargers beat the Raiders. That's just the truth. Why do you think the most popular show of all time on reality TV was like, what, the Kardashians, Jersey Shore, right? Like, that's yeah, what Jersey, people- like, uh, just a, a bunch of complete idiots, but amazing. Well, right, but people loved it. You're right, people it loved it. They tuned in to watch, tuned in to watch them do stupid, stupid shit, get too drunk, fall over, have sex with each other, say rude things, get into fights, puke. But, but Matt, like ask, from- ask, ask, ask yourself this. Okay. Kim Kardashian is a billionaire with a B and her whole family right. is too. Right. Why? How did, and, and I look at Kim Kardashian as I think she is a transcendent human being that we need to study and understand how she did this exactly. Because it's, it's fascinating, yeah. isn't it? She has no redeemable talent at all. She was the Here's daughter that. of like a decently good lawyer who wasn't even the top lawyer in the O.J. Simpson case. People knew who he was. But how did she go from that, selling handbags to people on the street, to being a billionaire and the most recognizable person on the planet? She should be celebrated. And we should put her as like – she, and she is. We think of her as like a lunatic and an idiot. But like think about her story. That's the new world today. Yeah. That's the and kind of like Paris Hilton. L- listen, yeah. I watched it. There, there was a There's documentary on Paris Hilton. I think it was called Being Paris Hilton. And it talked about how Paris Hilton was getting like she would you were open, let's say you have a a, a nightclub in New York. Yeah. For seventy five thousand dollars, she pulls up in the limo, gets out, waves to everybody, gets some photos taken, goes in ta- inside, gets photos taken. She hobnobs for about 20 minutes. She's there a total of 30 minutes, walks out the back, gets into a car, drives to another area, another place, goes to the another club. There she has to stay for over an hour and a half. So she gets $250,000. It was talking about the outrageous amount of money this chick was making with at, the, at her height. That it was, she was, it was like a million to two million a week. She was making being Paris Hilton. But you have to look at the crumbling of society and say, this is kind of where it's come from, right? Because we just, you just talked about like, like lower middle class people, right? You look at this country, right? What it was built on subways, skyscrapers. You know, you ever see that photo of all those guys having lunch on like that beam? Of course. Like people like that, right? That was, what we were built on to what you just described, right? What do you think those guys in that beam, what do you think they were making an hour? Actually, nothing. Right. And they didn't say shit. They did what they had to do. I mean, you even look at today, there are guys, iron workers, they're climbing to the top of, you know, the freedom tower in New York. There's still people like it, firefighters, trash men, all these people. And you have a person who you just described, who's making a quarter million dollars, probably every half hour. To walk through a club, walk out the back and leave. That's all she used to do. Eventually, society will fall because of people like that around it, won't it? <laughs> you would hope. Like, does, does it surprise anybody that you mentioned the 40s and 50s and even before that, where we're building stuff in this country, making shit? And now look, it's the people that are well known are just, they're just better marketers than everyone else. Like all the people that we know of as famous, what are they actually good at? They can't hit a baseball really far or they can't solve a riddle or, or, or some kind of problem. They just, they just are alive. That's all they really do. It's crazy. Yeah. I think, and I think the true innovators that are out there are not given the credit, like even Elon Musk. Yeah, I, I was watching. They were ta- they were interviewing students in universities, and these these women and these guys were like, "Oh, he's an idiot. He's this. He's." And I was like, "What are you talking about?" But, but again, that goes back to like it. It always goes back to politics, man. Because 
those people, those ritzy universities or like these liberal places, these liberal studies colleges, they're told that Elon Musk is bad. Joe Rogan's bad because he kind of sometimes talks about Donald Trump and it's like, well, he's bad. It's like, well, no, he's just trying to like talk about what's going on. And you just assume he's that way because he lives in Texas and might think a certain way about things. If you don't think a certain way, you're, and that's, I think, really concerning too, where, as you said, like, it's, it's, it's the pervasive thought of what someone is just because of maybe one thing they've ever said. Like, you had the pictures on your wall. You may or may not be a Trump fan. Look, I think Barack Obama, the story of Obama becoming the first black president, it's unbelievable. It's a beautiful thing from 50 years before his people were, they literally couldn't drink out of the same water fountain as you and me. And now he's right. a president. But you still have people that will equate me because I find that to be super impressive. Oh, I'm a liberal. It's like, well, no, I just find him to be a really good order that speaks. Great story. Yeah, it's extraordinary. That's all. But that's, I think, the really concerning thing we have is that you can't put stuff on your wall because of what you might think about them or it's. I never thought we'd see that in this country, but you, you know, it's funny about that with the Barack Obama yet with Barack Obama, I feel very presidential came off very, very smooth, very articulate. He's probably very, the greatest speaker ever. Right. And you know what? Disagree with his politics. Sure. And, and I'm not saying I don't politics, either, but very presidential. George Bush was a bad dude. Did a lot of bad things. Right. But when September 11th happened, I don't think there could have been a better person to command the country for a few weeks. I don't agree with him. He had a moment. Right. He had a moment. Right. Like, he's not a transcendent president. He's not FDR. He's not Abraham Lincoln. But it's like, you know, it, it's like uh, going into, you know, Iraq, right? Yeah. Like, everybody's like, oh, they lied about this. I get it. They lied about the the WMDs. I totally understand. And I disagree. I I, I feel like that's completely wrong. But I don't have a problem going into uh, going into I think you um, Iraq. had to do something, right? You had to. Right, attack. I, I'm saying I don't. I don't care about going to Iraq. I just don't want to be lied to. Sure, go in. Go. But you know what I would rather they say? We're going in for the oil. We need the oil. These guys are manipulating the market. We need the oil. We're going in. Fuck them. But don't lie to me. Don't lie to me to give me a, some bullshit context of why you're going in because it's the right thing they have to stop it yeah, but bro. That's he's a bad the guy i could give a shit they're going they, they, look at all the wars we've been in there's always an ulterior motive to why we're doing it right and just tell me when, when people say fine. when people say stuff like oh well maybe this happened because they wanted this to happen then you're regarded as a conspiracy theorist maybe matt the people that are conspiracy theorists maybe they're the ones that are actually the right ones aren't they maybe Maybe the yeah. government is a bunch of shithead scumbags. How many times has it come? How many how many things have there been out there? Where, listen, UFOs. I mocked people for believing in UFOs when I was younger. I had a guy in in at Coleman mocked him mercilessly. Like, why would they be? I mean, I did all the things. Why would they be here? It, if they wanted to come and take over, they just take over. Like they don't need to pretend that they don't have to hide. They don't have to technology. Uh, you know, th they're so far advanced from us that they would, if they wanted to get rid of us, they would just come and they'd sprinkle some pixie dust and every human being on the planet would be dead. Like it, that's how far advanced they are. Like, and I would go on and on and on. And then guess what? The Navy releases these tapes of, of UFOs and I'm going, and that's mm. why, like, when I see a film, like the that film I talked about, it always seems like they almost try to predict this shit, right? Like, that C word that happened a couple of years ago, if you right. remember, there was a movie about that, like, 10 years before. And it's like, well, maybe we should have worried about that a little bit more, right? Like, you know, like, I'm just saying be aware. Be, yeah. you know, don't just take what you hear on, look, every news station, no good. Find your own news, you know, because they ain't telling you what you really need to hear. Okay. What, 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 what do you think is going to happen with this whole, um, the Michael Franzese? And it's funny too, because like you never, we never really got into his backstory, but I think everybody knows his backstory. He was, 
right? Or you want to tell yeah, me that quickly, real quick? M- Michael, Michael is a guy who I think gets a pretty bad rap as he was just this guy's son who happened to become like a mob captain. Uh, Michael had probably, he was involved in one of the most groundbreaking schemes the mafia ever was involved in. It's this gas tax scheme, which I'm sure you've heard about. Uh, Michael wasn't the creator of it, but he was directly involved with the origination of it. And Michael made a lot of money. Michael was a playboy. Michael was the son of a very famous person, John Sonny Francis. Um, now, he was in and out of jail his whole life, did essentially 35 years of a 50-year sentence, and was constantly in and out. Michael then cooperated. He absolutely did. Put his hand up. Uh, and he did some time in prison, came out, and created a media empire. And uh, Michael is popular because he's surrounded himself with very smart people that market him well, po- popularize him, make him out there and aware. And why Joey went at him, I'm not exactly sure. I think it really just had to do with Joey maybe felt like, why the hell would you ever ask me to come on this show? You know damn well I'm not coming on. And I don't think Michael would respond. Michael is not that kind of guy. He's never responded to those types of people, uh, the people that try to goad him into saying stuff. But he did, and it's been a back and forth. Where do I think it'll go? I, I think it's I think it's over. I really do. I think I think it's done. I think Joey will occasionally hit some of these guys, but I don't know where else you go with people like Gene or Michael. I feel like you've said what you've said, and that's that. Um I think it will ultimately probably end in the government continuing to try to pursue Joey. I mean, Joey knows that. He's not dumb. They hate him. I mean, Joey's friends. There's a guy, uh, Matt, Peter Tuccio is his name. Uh, I, I meant to ask you about that. Yeah. Peter I, have, was, I have it written down. Yeah. Peter's a guy who he's about, he's about 30 now. Um, but about six, seven years ago, Peter was Gene Barello. It's exactly the kind of guy he was. Up and coming kid, wanted to be a guy in the mob, was running around with Gene. You can ask Gene when you interview him. He used to run around with Peter. Peter's from Howard Beach. His stepfather was a cop. He's not cut out for that world. But his uncle was a member of the Lucchese crime family. He's bouncing around, doing little deeds for people. Um, He lit a car on fire, got arrested, him and two of his friends. They were collecting a debt for a, a mobster. And Peter... His two co-defendants pled out. Peter decided, you know, I'm going to be out on bail. I'm still going to hang out with mobsters. Starts hanging out with Joey. Starts going to court with him. Starts hanging out with people in the Philadelphia Mafia. Sentencing time comes for Peter. I understand his other co-defendants got no prison time. Peter got 10 years. He's currently at Loretto in Western Pennsylvania and won't get out until I think 2030, I think is his release date. Now understand, Peter owes no one nothing. He's not a made member of the mafia. If you look into sentencing guidelines for arson for a first time offender, at most, he'll maybe get 48 months, something like that. Right. They give him 10 years. Why do you think? Because he's hanging out with Joey. They were hoping he would, I'm sure they floated it to him. Tell us something about him. Come on. Right. But I don't think he knew anything. It, right. The kid probably just was, you know, found Joey interesting. And I'm sure Joey found him interesting. Whatever. They know each other. They know people that, that each other know. And that was it. It was very, I think, guilt innocent. But that's what hanging out with him can do for you, I think, sometimes. Peter's got 10 years. And Peter will get out eventually. And he's the future of the mafia. That's just how it is. But a lot of kids like him, they just don't exist anymore. He's a guy who is, I mean, he was a guy beating up people in bars, just a real idiot. I mean, to be honest, anybody that knew him hated him. But I think being around Joey, they're going to enhance things. They hate him. He knows that. His lawyer knows that. Everybody knows that. Why do you think he hates the government? Why do you think he always talks about the government? Because they have done things to him that they wouldn't do to most of society. Everybody gambles on their phone, Matt. Everybody. But they got beat up in court. By Joey, he beat the rap on the case. Nobody beats the feds, but he did. They were butthurt, and they brought some bullshit case against him. And they're going to continue to pursue him. They're going to create things, and and that's just the life he lives, sadly. They don't believe, in, and I will stick up for Joey, they don't believe that people like him can improve and change their life. I don't think they believe that. They did it with John Gotti Jr. for years. They pursued John Gotti Jr. for years. 
you're a mobster, you're a mobster. He said, no, I'm not, I'm out. They didn't care. They continued to pursue him. Look at what they do to the mafia still. They bring popcorn headline cases against the mafia every week in New York City. 70, 80-year-old guys. They're going after them three, four, five times. Yet you can sell kilos of heroin on Philadelphia street corners and nothing happens to you. You can carjack people and you're out in 12 hours. The government hates the mafia and they're always going to come after them. And they still come after them and they're going to keep going after them. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it makes you think he's got problems. He's got, a, he's got some, he's got some problems if he's doing the wrong thing, if he's doing exactly. the right thing. And I believe he is a guy who just wants the last 20 years of his life to be, because his father died in prison. His Joey's father died in 2013 in prison. His mother just recently passed. I think Joey looks a lot of his life and says, well, you know, I had a crazy life, did a lot of crazy things, went to jail a lot, but I have a future now. I'm sure eventually he'll have grandkids. You know, nobody wants the 30 or 40 or 50 years of their life to define them, but sometimes it does. And for Joey, it will. But I think he just wants a little peace and to get back to normal and just try to make some money doing something and show the government he has a taxable income. And as you said, if he's not doing anything wrong, then I think we'll be fine. But I think we've learned with the government, with him, they find things on him and they just, they keep pushing and they're going to look for stuff and, you know, that'll be that. It's funny how it's broken up, right? Like all kind of the true crime, like you've got the mob genre, you have the prison genre, yeah. you have the true crime genre, you have kind of the the serial killer genre. Mm-hmm. You know, and all of it's kind of, to me, falls under true crime. Yeah. Uh, it, but but these guys, I interviewed um, what, um, John A. Light. Uh, and I have, a, I, I've never I have a long seen, history with John. I mean, I've never seen so much hatred. Yeah. Well, I, I these guys. Listen, John is very um, controversial. And I will right. tell you that him and I don't. It's not on my end. He he doesn't have the greatest relationship towards me. He left me several scathing voicemails telling me I'm this and I'm that. He he doesn't like the type of reporting that I do. He feels that I'm one sided. John is a guy who there's no arguing was connected to the mafia. That that's 100 percent true. He was in Woodhaven. He was connected with Junior Gotti. Um, do I believe he met John Gotti maybe once or twice? Probably. I think if you're around Junior that much. You probably ran into him, but Matt, the truth of the matter is he didn't kill anyone for John Gotti. That's untrue. He was chased out of the neighborhood. He went to prison, decided to cooperate, and he took the stand against Junior. He was a terrible witness. Junior beat the rap on the case because he was a terrible witness, but he was a lunatic. He'll, he would beat you to hell up in the street. He would rob you. He would do what he had to do. He was definitely a tough guy, but I think the truth about John is, and a lot of these guys, they have the standing. People know who they are. They have the name Gotti connected to them. They can enhance kind of what they were and who they were. I think that's one of the reasons John at times doesn't like some of the reporting that I do because I'm not playing that game. I'm not playing the game with those people. I'm going to go to the people that knew them and I say, listen, tell me about this person. And I'm going to try to right. vividly tell you about them. And no one will argue John wasn't tough. Was he a killer for John Gotti? No. No. Well, you know, it's funny too, because when I interviewed him, um, shoot, uh, Mike Dowd was there. I know Mike, yeah. So I was supposed to interview John Mm -hmm. and Mike Dowd kind of was like, oh, come on. I want to be here. We're good together. We're good together. And next thing you know, he's kind of, I don't want to say bullied, but you know, you know, wedged his way into it. So I was never really able to just interview, um, a light. So, and, and a light story, you know, when he told me the story, he, I don't know what kind of podcast these guys have been on, but like my podcasts are hours. They're not 30 minutes. Sure. I, I, I can't, you can't tell me anything. Not, you can't tell me very much about yourself in 30 minutes. So when he got here, you know, Dowd would throw in these comments and joke and laugh and, and have fun. And all he wanted to do was have fun. And I'm trying to interview this guy and, and a lights giving me these kind of, uh, vague you know, responses that he has. So I never really was able to pry into his story. 
So, you know, although well, I interviewed him, it wasn't a great interview. And, and that was probably my fault. I probably should have just put my foot down and told Mike, listen, bro, like, no, stop. You, you need to, you know, let me interview this Michael guy. Michael Dowd is one of the slimiest people I've ever come across in. People love him. Right. But they love him, though. I've interviewed his partner, Ken Urell, who was kind of there. They hate each other uh, now. Right. Um, now, Ken, I found to be extremely compelling, very contrite. I think Mike is is just an arrogant low life. I mean, he just really is. Right. Um, that said, you're right with John. He has a really interesting story on my channel, though. I try to tell, like, I, I want to interview you, sh- sure, but that's coming from your mouth. I want to then do an expose on what I find about you because everybody, regardless of who they are, sometimes will trump up who they are. Right? They'll say, right. "Well, I did this and I did that." Autobiographies are tough because it's from your mouth, right? I want to do my own digging on you and I, I want to find out my own stuff about you and asking people that knew you and that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I would definitely maybe give it another shot with John. Um, I think at any rate, he's an entertaining guy. He has a lot of great stories and um, you know, he's definitely seen a lot. Um, you know, I'm Albanian and so is he. So I think maybe that has something to do with some of the issues we have with each other. Um, I've always tried to stay play straight with John as far as how I feel about him. I always make it clear. I don't have any favorites in what I do. I don't like or dislike any of these people. I just try to tell their story. I gave John an opportunity. He declined. Um, so I did my own show, but maybe give it another shot. He's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I had him here too. Like it's, um, yeah, it's too bad. It wasn't a better uh, interview. I, I interviewed Mike Dowd, like when he was one, I think it was my first interview or one of my first interviews and it did great. I think it's got a couple hundred thousand views you know, he was good. It's funny too, because we were so, it was one of our, it was like our first interview. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, we didn't have a switcher for like, we have three cameras, so we didn't have a switcher. So we had to edit it. And so my editor did it. And I mean, literally you've got Dowd like talking and and it's saying something completely different right. or I'm talking while he's talking I, in just one or two spots, right? Not, it's not super bad. But overall, though, it, it's it's a good podcast because, look, Dowd will tell his story over the course of an hour and a half, two hours, and he knows exactly how to tell it. But then again, he also skates over anything that really makes him look super, you know, super, super sleazy. It's or, one of the, or It's one of the challenges you have and I have. I interviewed Sammy right. Gravano, and I was called the day before, and I was told, this is stuff I will not talk about. Right. And it's hard because – Listen, Sammy's been around. We've heard his stories. And I want to get into the meat of the story, but there's certain things he doesn't want to talk about. They also always make themselves the heroes in the end. And they don't want to. And and that's why there's two types of people that inform to me. There are are the truthful ones that are contrite and admit what they did. And then the others that make excuses and don't want to admit what they did. And it was everybody else's Mm -hmm. fault but theirs as to why they did it. Look, the truth is, Matt, you know this. Everybody knows this. The reason you cooperate against someone is because you don't want to go to prison. It's very simple. Yeah. There's no other, yeah, I, I'm not that say, person I'm, did it or it, you didn't want to go to jail and nobody, I don't fault you for that. Right. Everybody's different, but that's the truth. Right. Well, you know, what's funny is in the comment section, you'll have these guys. It's always, as a matter of fact, it, Marlino even said it when he was, when he was talking about, uh, uh, Franzese, he was saying, uh, you, uh, he's a lying rat. He's actually not a lying rat. Well, you know, he actually didn't No, I'm, I don't mean, I don't mean frenzies. I'm saying in general, it's always, he's a lying rat. No, no. He's just a rat. Sure. The person just told the truth. Yeah. That's what you're upset about. Sure. You're upset. Cause I told the truth and cooperated and you, you ended up, I spread some of my time around like, and I get it. You're pissed off and that's fine. But by calling someone a piece of garbage or a lying rat or all the things you can, you can, a snitch or whatever. Like, do you think that I snitched on someone and now, and your opinion of me matters that you calling me a rat. Do you think that affects me at all? Right. I'll weigh, I'll, I'll take 12 years off my sentence. Somebody calls me a rat periodically. 12 right. years, not a hard choice for me, bro. No, but there's one thing about Michael Francis that we can say, okay, regardless whether you don't like the guy, you like him, whatever, it doesn't matter to me. Whether he ratted or not, doesn't mean shit to me. I couldn't care less. Yeah. He's a very regal, nice guy. I don't think there's he, anyone. He, he's qu- quite classy in his delivery. He's great. 
listen, I every time, and I'm not saying that, like the rat or the or the the whole cooperating or whatever you want to say about him. I don't know, and I don't care, you know. But but he's you know he's listen, he's a class act without a doubt. He is a class act, and Marlino, you know, or Merlino isn't. I mean, he's just a you know he's guttural, he's bottom of the barrel. And I, I see, you know, Franzis is, is absolutely a top notch, top shelf individual. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why, I don't know why Joey did that. I think, um, I think it really kind of bothered him that Michael would ask him to come on a show, and I did find that to be interesting. Sammy Gravano did it as well. They invited him to come on, which I thought was incredibly tone deaf because if you know Joey, he ain't going to ever come on the shows with those right. guys. But the truth is, whether it's Michael Franzi, Sammy Gravano, Gene Barello. Jerry Molina doesn't know them. He's never met them. He's never in the streets with them. He didn't, they weren't in his case. Um, I, I think Joey's smarter than maybe we think he is. I think he realizes now that he's in the public eye and you got to get people to watch the show. And Joey knows damn well that putting the name Gene Barello or Mike Franzi in the title over Joey talks about the Lions and Packers game, it's going to do a lot better. Right. Right. You and I do it. We all do it. And that's just yeah, how YouTube works. Yeah. I don't have a problem with clickbait. I mean, I do, but the fact is everybody does it. And if you don't do it, then guess what? You're going to be left behind. But, but again, you know? Matt, if you do a show and I say something like Mike Dowd is a scumbag and you put that in the title, you didn't lie. I said that it's part of the show. Right. Clickbait yeah. is when you do stuff like me and you talk about um, football for an hour and you put, Jeff Nadu admits to killing someone in a video. Like it, right, right, right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess so. I think it's I, I was thinking just kind of misleading, but yeah, sure. you're right. Um well let's 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 go back to unless, you know, the the interview is you know, basically, you know, you and I uh kind of start you know talking. We have a, a mutual friend, Wade, and uh <laughs> my wife, you know, my wife's not here, but if she was, she's always like, she goes, love Wade. You know, she, she, like Wade's a great guy. I've had, you know, we've had dinner several times. We spent a ton of time. I've interviewed him. Like he's, he's just a, a, a great guy. He's got a great story. He does. I don't know if you, I do did you interview him? Yep. I've known oh him. yeah. And he tells it great. You know, he really, he really does. He does a great job of it. But so, you know, so I'm, what what I'm wondering, and this is also, by the way, how I kind of came, although I've seen your content, you know, I didn't know you knew Wade. And, and honestly, like, I don't know anything. These guys in the comment section that will say, this guy knows nothing about, you know, the mob genre. You're absolutely right. Like, I just don't. I don't know anything about it. That's I, actually I probably a good little. thing. So, I, you know, it's a, it's definitely a fresh eye. I can barely pronounce the names. I was raised in, in South Florida. I'm very poorly educated. Uh, you know, don't know a lot of Italian guys. Although I grew up down the street from uh, Joseph Trapacani wow. and, and knew his and knew his son hmm. and, uh, you know, in Temple Terrace, Florida. So I remember his son used to walk around. He would find like money in his dad's pocket and you'd find like a hundred dollar bill. And it was always like, wow. So anyway, I so I don't I don't know much about it, but, you know, Wade had sent me the video where your channel had gotten demonetized. Right. And I listen, and I was where I texted you this, I was terrified. I was just like, I don't understand what happened. Like you didn't understand. No. Like we'll have to we'll have to get into that at some point here. I didn't initially understand. Um I think what bothered me about that so much, it, it was really just how ruthless YouTube is, right? You're right. Where there's no warning. It was just, I got an email one day, the day before Thanksgiving, and it was like, hey, you're out. I don't know why. They just said what I did, and that was that. And it was hard for me to acknowledge. But you know, I think when I look back on some of the shorts I was putting up, I think you use some of the stuff and you just think, oh, it's just a movie clip, you know? Um, and reposting that, if you don't add anything original to it, they consider it a policy problem. And you know, I ended up starting a new channel and, you know, down the road, maybe I'll remonetize that channel. Um, I work really hard on that channel. The one thing in my content career that I've never been able to figure out was YouTube for a lot of years. I'd always, I figured out TikTok. I figured out Twitter. I figured out whatever, but I couldn't figure out YouTube. And I finally found something where it worked and yeah, it was, it, it sucked. It was uh, disappointing, but you know, you got to pick it up and move on and start another channel. And now I have two. So. 
Right. So how did you, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, you, you lived in Philadelphia. I did so live in Philadelphia. Yeah. Born and raised in Philadelphia? Or? So I'm actually from west of the city, a town called Lancaster. It's actually the biggest Amish population on the, in the country. Um, but I live in the city part of Lancaster. And for me, I'm not like you connected to the mafia. My, my, my father wasn't in it. My uncle wasn't in it. Um, when I was 10 years old, the Sopranos came out. And I remember every week in my house, it was appointment viewing from my mother and father. They would watch it every season until 2007 when it ended. And The Sopranos has always been very um, important in my life for some reason. Because again, as a kid, I watched it. I would sit outside of my parents' room and I'd watch it. And I remember when I was like 12, 13, I used to watch these um, the show called Mobsters. It was on A&E. It was like DC biography shows where they would just talk about it. And I was always fascinated by the mafia and kind of to present day. I got into content many years ago, sports betting. That was my first start in business and content. I worked for a company called Barstool Sports twice. Um, and in April of 2021, I left that company. And I said, you know what? This year, I'm going to start something that I'd always wanted to do. I always had an interest in the mafia. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to jump in. And I'm going to start talking about mafia members, You know, do biographies, little shorts on them. And it took off. Um, I jumped on YouTube. And the rest is history. I started interviewing them. I started doing news on it. You know, there's still news in the mafia. It's still around. So I just kind of turned it into something. And, and now you know, we're one of the bigger channels that talks about it that was not associated with the mob. We are there are two types of mob tube channels. There are people that were in that world and there are people like me who are not. And um, I just try to find interesting stories and tell them and keep that whole history alive. Okay. Um well, but, I mean, you said you worked in the. Yep, I was in for the. For yeah, so I was gambling. in media, and and that was always you know sports betting was always something that had come natural for me. I'd been gambling my whole life, and um, starting to sit down was really just a hobby. I, I'd always been interested in just doing a podcast that wasn't related to sports because I wanted to kind of branch out and do something else because I didn't want to be just dependent on sports betting content. So I just did it as a hobby when I started the show in 2021, and I thought, well, if this gets a thousand people that watch it, I'd be proud of that. And within 10 episodes, I was getting 15,000 downloads a month on iTunes and just ran with it. And then I ended up going back to Barstool, took the show there. Um, we interviewed Sammy Gravano. We've interviewed all sorts of people. And it was just kind of a grassroots thing that I started. I had no connection to the mafia. Like I said, I lived in Philadelphia. I seen those folks uh, on the street, but in the neighborhood I lived in was, you know, there was a mafia there, but I, d I didn't have any run-ins with them. I didn't know them. I was just always interested in it. Okay. Um, well, so how long did you run the channel? You had, how many subscribers did you have? I was at almost 70,000. Right. I, 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 I started kind of really putting out content on YouTube at the end of 2021. And by like summer 2023, I was, I was flying, man. You know, we were doing, yeah. you know, two episodes a week, throwing a bunch of shorts out. I did a lot of live content, you know, talking to people. Like I said, interviewing people was big. You know, we, one thing I try to do on my channel is bring people out of the shadows, mob associates that we've never heard from. I interviewed a judge, um, FBI agent, DA agents. I do a lot of stuff with cartels. I do a lot of content with that on TikTok. So I, I like to say I talk about organized crime, not just the mafia. But um, but you mentioned like the true crime, how there's all these different subsets of it. Um, right. But yeah, YouTube I've been doing for two years or so now. Okay, so you so what is it when they when you got the letter from uh, from YouTube or the email from YouTube? Yeah. You read it and you went and you checked. I'm sure you immediately went to your um, to your studio and looked at it. There was a big thing that said demonetized, like I was demonetized as of this Whoa. date. And I went into and, and, and go ahead. I was going and what what did you determine? So you read everything. Like, how did you figure it out? Like, I mean, they didn't tell you, right? You said it was said it was kind of a blank. No, I knew right away it had nothing to do with the videos that I put out, like the actual recorded videos, because every recorded video I do is me just putting a story together and telling you it, just like I'm sitting here now. Right. What I had started to do is about six months prior to that, I'd found out that. Through another content creator, weirdly enough, Ian Bick, he had told me the way to truly grow your channel with subscribers and everything is putting shorts out. And over five months, I had a 
I'd grabbed like a hundred thousand followers on TikTok, and I was telling the same stories on TikTok just at smaller intervals. So I was taking them and repurposing them on YouTube, just like every other person does. But what I started doing as well to promote the channel is I would take movie clips and just pop them up. And I found this really rare interview, Henry Hill, the real Henry Hill from Goodfellas did with Howard Stern back in the late 90s. And a mob guy calls in and confronts Henry on the air. And I I thought it was super rare. So I took it and I put it on my shorts. It did, I think, 6 million views. Like it was huge, the short. Like I was getting like 200,000 views a day on this short. And um, I had two or three other movie clips that I posted. And the letter said that I got docked for reused content. And I looked up what that meant. What is reused content? What does that policy mean? Essentially, what YouTube says is if you take a clip from someone, you have to add an original flair to the video. So, for instance, if I'd have taken that clip and I put a little face of mine in it and said, this is Henry Hill and the Howard Stern show in 1997, that would have been a fine clip to post. Right. But I just took it and repurposed it and they hit me for it. Well, I was going to say, because I know people that like I do that all the time. I'll grab movie clips, but the movie clip, I don't just put it up. Like I don't use the audio on it. I'll just it's it's as you're telling a story, yeah. I'll show the movie clip. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. I would or, just, and usually I even add a filter to it. Yeah, then then you're fine. I was just taking it from its original video and just posting it. And because yeah, you're just saying, hey, look at this to my yeah, my and, followers. And, and again, right? like I felt like it was six million people saw that video. So I felt, felt like for Howard Stern, that would be good. And you know, everybody right. benefited from it, but I had about five videos like that. And I determined that I believe that's what it was from. Um, And I have noticed that from what I've read, other channels have gotten hit with shorts. And I kind of just deemed that they weren't really worth it. And I think by that point, I had so many subs that were just subbing and they weren't watching the videos because they'd saw me on shorts. And I just decided I had to wait three months. February, I can reapply for monetization, but it's not a guarantee I'll get it. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to start a new channel. I'm going to start flushing new videos out and um, you know, people will find them hopefully. And I think what I'm happy with now is on the new channel, I only have 6,000 subs, but I'm getting 4X the views, which I find to be pretty, you know, two to 4X views on the, the video. So I think that's pretty impressive. I'm trying to get a new algorithm, if you will, and just try to start over. Yeah, I think that it's funny because I got, a huge boost. I probably got 75,000 subscribers within a few months. Yeah. Um, when, because I had a video just blew up, got like 800,000 views and I had several shorts and one of them got like five or 6 million yep. views. That'll do it. Um, here's the problem is you don't it's get exact- on subs though. Right. Well, I was going to say, it means nothing. Right. Like, well, and even worse is that people are like, man, you've got, you know, you've got whatever, 150,000 or 170,000 subscribers. And I'm like, but they're, they're shorts subscribers. And that's they what, came from shorts and that they're was, not watching the videos. That's why that was one of the reasons I decided to start a new channel because I found that probably 70% of the subs I had weren't actually going in and watching my videos. They just maybe saw it and said, you know what? Subscribe. We have to realize that for anyone that doesn't know anything about YouTube, you could have a million subs, but if only a thousand people are watching your video, it doesn't mean anything. But you know, right. Matt, I really wanted that plaque for whatever reason. I, I, I'd never been able to master YouTube and I thought, okay, well, I'm sure most of these people watch my videos, but then as you alluded to, they don't necessarily watch the videos. Wow. So for me, I'm worried just now about putting out good content that people are going to watch and getting a good ten to twenty thousand subs, and hopefully getting fifty to seventy thousand views, because views is what you can make money on. And um, yeah, watch time, exactly right. So I, I think for me, that's kind of the focus. You know, again, putting out original things, people that no one's heard from, um, and, and and just trying to kind of keep it moving. You know. Yeah, I was going to say before all of that happened, I had. I probably, I had several months where, I mean, every video I was putting out was getting 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 
views. And I mean, whether it was whether they were remote or they were in person, they were all all of them were getting were getting solid amounts of views. And then I had that huge hit on, you know, or that spike on my subscribers. And I and, and that was a good month or two. I had a good few months right d- during that because people because it was really the one or two videos at that time did very well. And then like maybe a month later, I had a video that suddenly out of nowhere started doing well. One that had gotten like 15,000 views and suddenly it got like 100,000 views within a month or so. It was like, wow, that's great. But then it all started kind of, you know, that, you know, you know, the the chart. Yep. You know, the chart was woo, woo, woo. And then it just slowly started going, started down. going down. And and now it's like some videos are getting 50,000 views. Some videos are getting 6,000 views. Yeah, it's really interesting how YouTube works. And it's the same on like TikTok. I have videos on TikTok that have done 2 million views. I have videos on TikTok that have done 10,000. And I, I don't know why. But one thing I have noticed, I went on my old channel this morning and looked at my views. Because it's been over a month since I've been demonetized. I've not posted one piece of content on there. And I still did 600,000 views last month, about 2,000 subs. And I didn't, because again, all my content is evergreen. You can watch it in 20 years and learn something, right? Yeah. So I think that's something, I've told a history about the mafia, right? So it's, I think that's cool. But yeah, you're right. It's interesting how, like one video will do 9,000 views, and then you'll do a video that does 60. Like it's, it's, it's interesting how they position it all, but. Well, and I have no idea what is going to hit like i I'll, i've done interviews where i've walked like the guy walks out of here and i've looked at colby and i've said bro that was amazing Col- that was amazing and colby will look at me he'll go man that that is going to be that was a great interview and it it's like the whole anything. time yeah eleven thousand views yeah and I've then had i have too. other yeah then i've had other guys where it's like a crackhead <laughs> that i'm thinking this guy's a maniac yeah. like he he's a maniac he never did anything he's just been in and out of jail it's not that interesting. He didn't do anything exceptional. He wasn't great at selling his, telling his stories. 90,000 views. Or I'll talk to some guy like who's like not even has nothing to do with my channel. Like th- there's not even true crime. I'm not even positive how I ended up talking to the guy other than I was desperate for content that week. So I scheduled him and he was talking about, you know, UFOs or something. Or, or no, this is a guy who did like a UFO tape. Where there was a, they were interviewing an alien or something, and he did. A, we did a whole hour and a half interview about the tape and how he got into it and all the thing. I think got like two hundred thousand views. I'm like, this is insane. How are people watching this? Well, I think one thing you do a pretty good job of is you find a way to get into other genres, right? So you did a video. I'm going to say it was a week or two ago on some of the goings on in Mob Tube, right, with Wade and with Wade it found its way onto my sh- screen. And I think what it did is it found its way onto a lot of people's screens that like mob content. And I think that's something that I I strive to try to do too is I want to get into, you know, the, I've interviewed people in prison. You know, I've done hundreds of thousands on that. I've never been to prison, but you find little ways to get into other sub genres and sub communities. And maybe you got into UFO uh, YouTube, you know, it's. I, I don't know what happened. People, people did like it. Um, you know, the guy was, he, the guy was, he was interesting, but I don't know. And I, I, I kind of, I find the UFO s- stuff interesting. And I heard you say that before. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I do, but I, I, I feel like I can't base a whole channel on it. Um, and honestly, I'm not, I, I don't, you know, I don't have time to learn about all the different alien stuff. And, and honestly, the only thing I really like talking about anyway, I couldn't even do talk about it that much. Because the only stuff I really am interested in, honestly, is probably cr- is crime. Well, I heard I you say why. something recently where you were talking about how, I think you were doing it with the weight on the wage show. You talked about how you kind of, and, and I'm pigeonholed into sometimes only talking about the mafia where like when it's like the truth, if you ask me, what do I really like to talk about? It's black organized crime cartels, tr- uh, transnational criminal organizations, geopolitics, how um, certain governments are, are essentially organized crime rings, terrorism. Like I like stuff like that. The mafia is cool, but I've done so much on it that it's like, and I heard you mention like you could sit here and talk about certain stuff, but it's like. Oh, shit. Was I talking about, I was talking about like World War II. Yeah. Like, yes, about, yes, that's uh, colonizing Mars. Yeah, 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 uh, like, yeah, yeah. 
Right. Those are the videos I watch. Sure. Sure. Um, I remember my, my wife one day, she, it was like a week straight. I was watching all this stuff on world war two, but every time she seemed to come in, it was about, uh, Nazis and, you know, the uh, Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. And, and so she came in one day and, and I forget what I said. Uh, I said, listen, I said, did I said, did you know that Hitler had a prison break? He actually, Mussolini was arrested and put in prison and Hitler sent in, a bunch of uh, of his um, paratroopers, and they parachuted out of an airplane in the dead of night, landed on top of the prison, went into the prison, took over the prison, and broke Mussolini out of the prison, and then put him back in power. I was like, like that's amazing. Did she and think she you were trying to like become like in the Aryan Brotherhood or something? Yeah, or? I, I think. And she looked at me and she said, "You're watching a lot of stuff on Adolf Hitler yeah. lately." <laughs> And I looked at her and I went, yeah, I said, it's amazing stuff. And she looked at me and she goes, is this going to be a problem? <laughs> and I said, I said, no. But she was serious. I said, no. I said, I just find it's, I said, did you know? And I started telling her about something else that had happened, right? Like these are stories that most people know. Okay, there's World War II. There was D-Day. There was this. There was that. There was the Allies, the Access Power. Like eventually we take, you know, we, we end up going into, well, we went up to, um, Berlin and, you know, and how, you know, there's the battle of the bulge and your Stalingrad and all the people know these basic battles, but there was so much intricacy between the, the interpersonal relationships between, um, the, the leaders mm -hmm. of those countries. And there are so many insane things that happened yeah. that these little things that happen for like that, the prison break thing that I told you about, mm -hmm. right? Like it's not necessarily a prison break, but well, no, it is it, they, they did, but that's the stuff of movies. Sure. You know, the idea that, did you know Hitler had, oh gosh, I can't believe I can't remember his name. Anyway, he was like, basically he was like in the second of, in command. He was like the vice president. So the vice president, essentially. Oh, Herman Gur was it? It wasn't Goering. Anyway, the point is, is he trains himself. He's so concerned that Hitler is going to start a war or is going to lose the war. He and, and Hitler's not listening to him. He trains himself on how to be a pilot, which he's not. He then has a plane specially modified with extra gas cans or extra gas tanks. He then flies in the dead of night all the way into um, uh, into to England and jumps out of the plane, never parachuted before. In the dead of night, lands, he's captured by a farmer with a shotgun and basically says, I need you to bring me to see, um, I forget the guy that he, he happened to have a, a, an acquaintance in, in uh, England that he felt was going to be able to get him a meeting with Winston Churchill so he could convince Churchill to um, make peace with Germany. So this is... This is like Kamala Harris flying into China, right. trying to meet with Xi Jinping to try and convince him to take a deal. Like people don't like that's insane. You you couldn't make the stuff up. That that's happened. why, like when I talk about the mafia, that's what I try to do. I try to find like everyone knows about John Gotti, right? Al Capone, The Sopranos, right? But I've told stories, and I think you you kind of seem like you do that as well, where. I'm trying to find more integral details about like I've heard stories about the mafia and no one's ever heard. But even if you look at global politics right now, there's all sorts of things going on under the surface that we never heard hear about. Like for instance, right. the public, people like you believe when you hear the name El Chapo, who do you think of? Right. I mean, you think of the Sinaloa cartel. The truth you is though. He didn't run the Sinaloa cartel, and I know Mayo did. Mayo Zambada, Mayo, right? Yeah, and I bet you. But didn't everybody know, says Chapo. I bet you didn't know this too. El Mayo's wife, her brother was a CIA asset. He, he worked no, for the CIA. So, like a I lot of people believe that the reason he's never been arrested is because he's being protected by the CIA and the DEA, and that's how the drug war works. But there's all these things that go on. Like it's right. You have to, as an American, just do research and look into these things. And it seems like you do that, which I like. I relate to that. Yeah. When I, when I do some research or I get interested in something, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, 
everybody, you know, they said they, they believe everything that they, they hear on CNN, which yeah, kills sure. me. That's, which, and it, that's it, very it, scary, isn't it? Because it, it is. if something were really to happen, like, like, look at what's going on around. We, we just hear it's always a red blue thing, right? For me, it doesn't matter. Right. I right? couldn't kill us about that. But the truth is every major power in the world is slowly banded together and are finding their way around the world, grabbing countries up and just taking control of everything. And before we know it, we look 10 years later and we're not strong anymore as a country. Really doesn't matter who the president is, whether it's Joe Biden or Donald Trump, it doesn't matter. This country's still not as strong as it once was. And I think the world around us is just crumbling and, and everybody else is getting stronger. And most people just say, well, on Fox News, though, they said today that, yeah, yeah, there's more I, to the world than that. It it always kills me. It's like everybody's always bending over backward to be inclusive and friendly and forgiving to all of what ultimately are people that hate this country. Yeah. And once you've given them everything, you think that they will be respectful for uh, of you. But the truth is these people will not be nearly as kind to you as you've been to them. Well, I felt there's, <laughs> this is something I found very, it's not funny. It's actually quite sad, really. So there's, obvi- and I don't want to get, I don't want to get your show demonetized or anything. So I won't say the name, right. but there's a certain group that is fighting with an I country, yeah. right? Right. Now that group is Islamic and they are one slot below terrorism really I mean, they are right. terrorists there are people in this country that are openly homosexual that support them and they say we yeah, love I'm- them and it's like <laughs> you do know it's if you crazy. went there they would throw you off a roof like it, it's it, but it's it's trendy it's, yeah, it's trendy to root for that you know or or whatever i mean when when all that stuff was going on with the police right with people the police killing people it was trendy to just say all oh, police kill people and it's like, well, yeah, but if you actually look at the numbers, they don't though. Like if if, right. if if you adhere to the rules, you likely will be fine in traffic stop, everything will go okay. Generally, though, the people that are killed by the police act stupid and do something they shouldn't do. It's always there's always these stupid campaigns that we fight for that no one really knows what we're doing with it. And then we find out five years later, it's like, well, yeah, they didn't really actually do anything and they just stole everybody's money and got rich doing it. You know, it's right. Like, and then you hear nothing about it. Yeah, exactly. Nobody wants to talk about that. Don't talk about that. Exactly. Or, or, or if you stop the people in the street and they say, well, you know, and you, and, and you just say, why? Oh yeah. They can never answer. They can never tell you. Like, why do you, why is the P country fighting with the I country? And right. they have no idea. They, they just say, well, you know, I heard about it and it, you know, or like, why are we marching here today in the street? Oh, I, I don't know. It seemed like the patriotic thing to do. My friend Jan told me to come down. <laughs> right, right. And it's like, well, do you know what you're doing here? No, it just- Well, we're marching for something, right? It seemed like the thing to do. And I think that's my biggest thing with just the American way of life. I think America is a beautiful country. I've lived here my whole life. But I've said for years, my end game, 40 years old, is I want to live somewhere else. And it's not because I don't like this country. It's not because I don't like- um, a lot of the people here, I just don't necessarily still agree with a lot of the values I think we have. It's, I think, a shame where we've gotten to. And I don't think it's going to get much better anytime soon. I mean, it is supremely divided. Um, and, you know, you can't have a conversation like if I tell you I support a certain politician, you completely devalue what I'm saying, regardless of whether it's true or not. Most people do. And you right. can't have these conversations. It's, uh, it's really sad. Um, but well, and you'll get like I, I always joke around that like my channel's been um, that I'm uh, uh, what are they, shadow banned. Yeah, uh, because I used to have I used to have on my wall I used to have four Trump pictures. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now I can't vote. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Like I can't even vote. Yeah, you're. You know, right. and. Um, and I used to say, you know, I used to say that, you know, like I didn't, I, I never thought Trump was presidential. You know, he doesn't come off presidential. I said, I don't have a problem with his politics. I said, but he, he's not a, he's not someone that I think of as being presidential, you know? Um, I, I but you know, so like, I didn't feel like I was being, I, I was, you know, I, I felt like I was very middle of the road. Right. 
You know, like I would vote for whoever I think is is good for the country. Sure. Um, but but you're you know, rare like, nowadays because most people right. don't think that way. The fact that I had those those paintings up and people had mentioned them and were mentioning them in the comment section, I, I really do genuinely feel like um, as a result of that, I got shadow banned. And you probably did. I mean, and and I've never, you know, and I've never recovered from that. And I've had people say, you know, kind of like what you you did, like, hey, start a whole new channel. And it's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to grind it out. Like, I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. I'm going to double down. I'm going to put out more videos. And maybe someday I flip the switch on the algorithm and it blows up. Or maybe it doesn't. I mean, I put out enough content that I make decent enough money right now that I can just Keep going with what I'm doing. Here's the sad thing about what you just said. The people that generalized or the people above in YouTube that generalized who you are, the little that they realize, the people in the comment section that love Trump or they love Biden, the truth of the matter is when the rubber meets the road, those people do not care one iota about you. The people that run right. this country are in ivory towers and they watch the rest of us and laugh. And say, can you believe we actually get these people to think about this shit? And they actually agree with all this shit? Yeah. I mean, seriously. Because you do know that, I mean, most of the things that are problems in this country, this com- government won't stop. The drug trade has completely destroyed this country to levels of cities that were once beautiful and now hellscapes. We've handed over cities to criminals. Do you think the government will do anything about that? They could stop it tomorrow. They don't care. They don't care about you. I don't understand blind loyalty to politicians. I never have, never will. I've yet to find in my, and I've only been alive 34 years, but I've never found one politician that actually gave a shit. None of them care. And they all have skeletons in their closet. Yeah. And they're all, they're all making millions on the side yeah. here and millions of tier. And, you know, they're, they're all, there's this corruption at some level on every, with every single one of them. I mean, yep. the fact that these guys go in and they make 250,000 a year and they're worth a million dollars when they go into the office. And then eight years later they get out and they're, yeah. yeah, they're worth $40 million. And it's like, how did that happen? And, and they, they, the they always get that, all the stock tips before we get right. them. And they're all war mongers. They all, they all we want us constantly to be in war. My whole life we've been at war. I don't ever remember a time in my 35-ish years of living where we haven't been at war. And all the yeah. wars we've been in are completely idiotic. Completely. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, we never end up taking over some country and, and making no, bank. No, it's never bad. Like making a ton of money. It's always It always hits our coffers. It always hits our, And yet the people that push for the war always end up making tens of millions of dollars. And those and countries – are significantly worse off with us there. And when we leave, I will tell you right now, if you go to Afghanistan, the quality of life has precipitously increased since we've left. It just has. We have destroyed countries. We leave them in our wake and do nothing. We leave, oh, you're on your own now. And they find a way, just like you'll find a way, and just like I'll find a way. These countries don't need us. We need to worry about what we're dealing with here. Because I don't know if anybody's noticed, this is a lost country, man. It's getting harder. Yeah, really has. Yeah. It's funny. They keep, you know, oh, well, inflation is at, you know, 9%. I don't know about you, bro. But I, I, I tell you right now, what we were spending $200 a week. Now we're spending, or we're spending $150 a week. Now we're spending $250 to $300 a week on groceries. And I'm not eating anymore. No, we're not eating anymore. I mean, you even go to Everything. like your local, like I don't know, pizzeria, for instance. You order a, a, a sandwich, right? Years ago, you know, two three years ago, it was probably at most ten dollars. Right, now it's fifteen, sixteen dollars. Pizzas are more expensive. You go out to a restaurant. I mean, appetizers are all a la carte now. They all, you know, it's. You're right. It's it's a shame, but it, it's everything. It's not safe. Out. I went to Outback. Ste- I went to Outback Steakhouse right. the other day. It, you, uh, my wife and I used to go sixty bucks. Yeah, I spent a hundred dollars. That's not a ten percent increase. No, that's a lot more than ten percent. Sure. Yeah, it's I mean, a shame. It, I, and I don't. Th- and and that's one of the reasons I'm thinking down the road and thinking there's got to be somewhere because this used to be the country where 
you could make it and 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 you're happy and and quality of life's good. It's really not anymore. It's changed a lot. And and I'm looking at other countries and I'm saying, well, I can get way further with the money I have somewhere else. It's significantly safer. We're not constantly a target. I mean, some of the warning signs you see out there are are, are concerning. I mean, we've put a plus social media has really destroyed this country. I mean, it's you can go on for days about that. But um, let me ask you, why how why when you go on TikTok or Instagram, why do you constantly see videos about how life used to be here? And you look at them and you say, Wow, the '90s were so great, weren't they? The early 2000s were so great, weren't they? It seems like 20 years ago. Really, well, it was 20 years ago, but it seems like 50 years ago with how declined things have become. Why do we always see those videos? Because they remind us of what it used to be like. It's not like that anymore. Do you ever see that video where they showed uh, um, high school students in the '50s? Absolutely. <laughs> oh my god! It looks awesome. Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah. It looks they're really in, cool to live in that time. They're running obstacle courses. They're doing, you know, all kinds of stuff that kids now, this none is of the them problem yeah. right here. And, and, and again, I, I don't mean to be a conspiracy theorist because I'm, I try not to be, but if we actually think they don't, they don't drop those big things anymore out of the sky on countries. They don't do that anymore. Now what they do right. is they attack this, the internet, because that is the gateway to how this country operates. It's just the truth. And we make, as that movie said that was released recently, we've made a lot of enemies in this country. And at some point, you got to think they're going to come and get, get their money's worth. You know, there's a, um, there's a movie that's being yeah. released. It's fascinating. The, yeah. it's, it's, it's extremely sa- sad, scary, and concerning. And I don't think if you could, if you watch that, I, I ever since I watched it, I don't feel the same because it's just it's surreal in a way. Because, go ahead. Have you ever have you ever watched The Handmaid's Tale? No, but I've heard about it, bro. You got to watch that. Okay, it is. It's. It, I'm telling you right now. Like if you have to buy the, uh, if you have to buy the, um, I don't mind the seasons. Buy them. Have you seen I mean, the film it, though that that, I, that we're talking about? I, I haven't seen the film. It's not out. I've seen the trailer for the film. What you are, you're talking about? This, the one where there's no this there's like an American on, Revolution, right? No, that's the this civil that movie's about to come out. This movie's out already. It's on Netflix. Leave the world behind. It's called. Oh yeah, I saw that already. I saw that. I thought it was very sad, scary. You can envision yeah, that I mean, happening. You don't find yeah, it weird it that Barack it, Obama was involved with the production of it. I don't. I mean, I don't know. I, he I mean, was. He's on the. I credits. know he was. They were. They were executive producers. That's not weird to you. He wrote the I, screenplay for it. I mean, I I understand, but I, I first of all, it didn't. You understand? There was no. It didn't go anywhere. It just kind of. The but ending. I think was what it's trying to teach you is that's just the exact what it's trying to teach you. We are so programmed. Look at the end of the film. The little girl, the world's falling around her. She could go save her family and say, we found a bunker we could stay in. She didn't care. All she cared about was the television show. Throughout the whole film, it's all she talked about. And that's how this world is now. It's, I don't care about anything as long as I get home in time to watch The Bachelor. Like, I think that's what it's trying to tell us. But I thought it was scary. But don't you think it's amazing when when you were doing your prison time? Did you ever think that you'd down the road be able to go on the internet and talk about it and no, make money? Listen, when I, I I don't know if you've ever watched any of my stuff, but I like I, I I and I've said so. I've said this on several like the months preceding you know my release to the halfway house. I would I would lay in bed and think. Like, mm-hmm. what are you going to do to make a living? Sure. Like, really, the only truly successful thing I had ever done to really make money. Now, I'd bought a house. I, not a house. I bought lots of houses. And I'd renovated them and I'd sold them. But it's not like I was selling them to regular people. Like, I had the ability to put the house on the market. And 
I, if you came and looked at the house, like I, I know I can get you the loan. If I need to, I can even say, Hey, if you buy it for this price, I'll get, cut you a check for 20 grand. Hey, I'll get your down payment back. Hey, I can pay off your car with the excess money to make sure you just, I can sell a house. Like the houses are sold before they're even being renovated because I can incentivize the pot because I know I can do a fraudulent loan and make sure you get the loan and get money out and get your down payment back and we'll rent the house out. So, you know, my big fear was I was like, you know, most of the businesses, successful businesses I had, had some type of fraud involved in them. And so I would lay there and I would think, you know, what are you going to do to make a living? Mm -hmm. And, and I just found this out recently, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but I remember I used to think, you're going to like, bro, you're going to work at McDonald's, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like you'll work at McDonald's for six months or a year. And then at some point you'll, maybe you'll be able to get a job working at, you know, selling used cars, or you're going to live in someone's spare room. You're going to buy a, a, a vehicle that runs decently. Maybe it has AC. Maybe it doesn't. When I got my car and it had AC, I was thrilled, by the way. Only lasted a few months, but whatever. Um, my point is, is that I, and I recently found out that somebody told me, you know, McDonald's doesn't hire felons. And I was like, oh, so that was never even a possibility? So, I mean, I would, but I, that's what I was thinking. And I thought, that's what you're going to do. And you're going to be humble and you're going to be appreciative and you're going to keep your head down. And that, that's just going to be the rest of your life. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like I told myself that over the over and over again. Never thought, like, you're not getting a girlfriend. Why? Because you're probably not. You're just an old man now. You're never going to have any money. You're just an old man. You're probably not going to end up with someone. Maybe you do. I mean, you hope you do. Wasn't really something I thought about. And I thought what you'll do is you, you've got a website that you're, you've put up. You're going to put your stories on your website. You're going to continue to write. And you're going to... Put your books on, you're gonna get put your books on Amazon, try and sell some books. And you're gonna, you're gonna live in someone's spare room. You're gonna write on your spare time, put up the stories, and you're gonna try and maybe option some life rights, maybe get some documentaries made, maybe get a movie made, like maybe something will happen. But if it doesn't happen, you like writing true crime stories. You 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 get to turn the TV when you want. You you'll be okay. You know what I'm saying? Like little things like being able to actually get up and turn the TV yeah. without having to ask 150 guys, hey, you guys, can we watch the new season of Survivor? No, we're watching such and such. Or, you know, okay. Like, you have to write it on a list. Like, the whole week's scheduled out. So, you know, you get to – I'd never been on YouTube. So, everybody was telling me you got to do a true crime podcast. I don't even really know what that is. So, I got – when I was getting out, I had no idea of how I was going to even survive. None. I had no idea how depraved the country had become during my while I was gone. <laughs> so I didn't realize that they celebrated scumbags now. So now there's an actual venue to celebrate scumbags. Yeah. Hey, it's amazing. I'm a scumbag. <laughs> I can get on here. <laughs> and even then it took me a couple years. Yeah. Because you, you know what? And we talked about this uh, before I hit record. When I first left the halfway house, um, well, when I was in the halfway house, I had a buddy that told me, um, I told him, I said, I want to do a true crime podcast. And he was like, oh, you want to do a podcast? Okay. He goes, hey, well, you know, there's a guy here and he goes, I, he lives down the street from me in St. Pete. And I was like, he goes, he does a podcast and he does a real estate podcast. Like he's always got this real estate guy on. You should, you should talk to him. I was like, well, how do I get in touch with him? Because we're well, here. Let me check. And he checked. And he said, oh, he's got an email in the in the um, description box of his videos. And his name is Danny Jones. And he ran a podcast at the time. It was called um, Concrete. He's changed it since then. Wow. But, and I said, okay. So I looked and I was like, well, I don't think he's going to want to talk to me about real estate because I just got out of prison for fraud, for bank fraud and related to real estate. And he goes, yeah, but he'd probably answer some questions for you about how to start a podcast. And I was like, oh, okay. So I wrote him an email. He came back. I said, listen, I'd love to talk to you about doing a true crime podcast. We talked on the phone a few times. Uh, we talked for whatever, like 30 minutes to an hour. And he said, I understand what you want to do. Why don't you come on my show? 
He said, if you come on my show, that'll help gauge whether people are interested in you. What he's really doing is just trying to get some content, mm-hmm. right? Because now he's looked into me. He's heard right. bits and pieces of my story. He thinks, hey, I can get an hour or two out of this guy. So I finally, when I get out of the halfway house, I go there. He interviews me for two hours. That video ends up getting like 2 million views. Wow. Really within the first four months, it had over a million. Well, I'm now living in someone's spare room and I start getting emails from people. And I get an email from an entrepreneur group and they said, we would love to fly you in to um, Puerto Rico and have you speak with our entrepreneur group. We have breakaway groups where we hire individuals to come in and talk. And I got on the phone with a guy and I was like, I don't understand. Like, I, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm not an entrepreneur. Like, and, and I said, I'm a, I'm a convicted fraudster. And he was like, yeah, yeah, but we've seen your story and it's amazing. We'd like to pick your brain. Nothing illegal. Just we, you're, he is, think of it as you being entertainment. Yeah. Come tell your story for a couple hours. Let us ask questions. And it's just entertainment for us while we eat lunch. And I thought, hey, like, just be a dancing monkey. No problem. Right. I got gotcha. you. And they were like, what would you charge? And I was like, I have no idea. And the guy was like, I remember he said, I said, I don't know, like, how long am I going to be there? He goes, you'll be, you'll fly in. You'll, he goes, you'll fly in. I think it was, yeah, he goes, you'll fly in from, from the hotel. You'll come straight here. You will do our thing. And then he said, you'll go to the hotel. You can stay the night. And the next morning you go back to the back. He goes, so basically it'd be 24 hours. I was like, okay. Um, and as somebody said, you need to charge at least a two, three grand. And I was like, that's insane. Nobody's going to pay me that much money. That's crazy. And so I said, I th- want to say, I said, I'm thinking maybe 1700 bucks. And the guy goes, let's make it 1800. I will give you a hundred dollar per DM. Beautiful. I said, and he's giving me lunch, by the way. So I was like, okay, no problem. They fly me in. I go, I talk for about two, three hours during lunch, answer their questions. But in the meantime, what had happened was a friend of a friend, when I was talking about fi- pitching stories, told me, you know what you need to do? You need to talk to this producer friend of mine. She works with 50 Cent, it's a production company. And I said, okay. And I sent her some of my stories. She read them. She said, I want to meet this guy in person. I want to meet this guy. And I said, and the guy said, yeah, yeah. She can't meet you right now though. She's in Puerto Rico. And I go, where? He goes, San Juan. And I said, I'm going to be in San Juan next week. And he goes, hold on. He calls her, comes back and says, I, he gave her my itinerary. And she said, I'll meet him that night at this hotel. So I go I do the lunch. I then leave from that lunch, which also, how cool was that? That after, as I'm talking to these people, telling them my story, I'm like, well, hey, okay, so are we done here? And I was like, yeah. Hey, I said, I, I got to get an Uber to this hotel because I'm meeting a producer. So they're like, this guy is a mover and shaker. Right. But it's just coincidence. So I go and I meet her. I talk to her, shoot the shit with her for an hour or so. And then this guy, um, the guy from Entourage, the one that pay, played E. Kevin Connolly, yeah. Kevin Connolly comes in. So he comes in. He meets me. We talk for 45 minutes to an hour. He says, you need to be doing a podcast. And I said, I want to do a podcast, but I want to do it like heavily edited. I want to have, you know, like background music, interview people, like a, almost like a documentary. He said, nah, bro, you need to just get on the, on, you need to just get on podcast. He goes, I'll send you the equipment. You just have to record them. We'll put them up for you. He gives me this whole thing. Here's how, here's, here's uh, what you can do. I got people right now making $50,000, $100,000 um, a, a month. You can do this. He pushed it hard. And I was just like, no, 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 no. What a huge mistake that was, right? Because I'm just keeping in mind, I'd only been out of the halfway house a month or two. So you go so, from being in the halfway house to jet setting and having meetings with people crazy right right and then so what i do is i come what I, I end up coming back and so when i come back i still i i ended up going on soft white underbelly i go on vlad i go and so now these people are flying me all over the place having me do interviews but i had no channel and danny at concrete was telling me start a channel start a channel start a channel what are you doing you're doing these interviews and you're not you know promoting you, 
you have no way to monetize it. Like I, I didn't know what I was doing, mm-hmm. but yeah, like, uh, the guy, Kevin, um, O'Connell, like he was, he tried to tell me, but you know, you couldn't tell me, Danny tried to tell me, you couldn't tell me. I had multiple people trying to tell me. I think that's the biggest thing that like a lot of these mob guys deal with. And, and that's one thing I've noticed about, you know, I've worked with some of them where they don't want to give up control and realize that people like me, you know, several of the other guys that do this, I think they need us more than we need them. Right. So like, obviously you're telling the story, you know, whoever you are in the streets, but we got to get people to watch it. We got to get people to put it up. We got to get people to put the title on. We got to get people to hashtag it. We got to get all that stuff, cut clips. There's so much more to this than just turning a camera on and just running with it. And as you said, none of what I put out is like groundbreaking. Really? You can get this information anywhere. Really? It's just, I've no people. I have a following. I created a following doing something else. And as you know, you got to do so much more on top of it. And I think that's where some of these guys struggle, you know, what, like even like a guy like Gene, Gene doesn't have a show, right? It, it, well, look at John a light. Yeah. It's bouncing he around. Yeah. He bounces around. It's like, well, why don't you just, you know, use your spare room, spend two or $3,000, get the equipment, Use your spare room. Learn how to do it yourself. Like every time, by the way, like our episode and stuff that we did, like we had to send it to somebody that they had to have edited, that they had to have someone put it up, that they had to have. It's like, this is not difficult. You can do this yourself. I have no, no, I don't work. Nobody does anything for me. I do everything on my own. I do every right. video, every, everything I do. And that's how I want it because I want to do it. But like some of these guys that are in the mob genre, like Sammy Gravano would do so well if he had a, a host that knew the world, knew that content. Because, you know, as you know, like a host can, can pick you up when, when the, the conversation's slowing and can add things. But someone like you, you, you just had to learn, really. You just had to learn how to do it. But that's the problem. They either don't have a host or they don't have, know how to learn or they don't know how to do things. And you, it's hard to do this. You run out of things that talk about you had to be creative. And some people don't have the gumption to just keep going and saying, like, after 20 weeks, if I don't have any more content, well, now what am I going to do? You know, some people right. push through and some people don't. But um, that's a pretty amazing well, story you have, man. It really is. I was say, that, that's why when I started my channel, I started it at first where it was just me because I knew – I can do this for three or four months by myself, but after that, I'm I'm out. I'm out. I, right. I need I need to be able to interview people. I need to be have that interaction. You know, that's when I brought you know Colby in. Like I I knew the setup I wanted, and yeah, it's it's especially if you have very little um, know how you know as far as how to do do the operations and everything but you know like it, same thing with a a light he he could be a light and uh and gene they could be you know they they could be uh sammy gravano they could be well supposedly they're gonna restart the show soon i don't know if that's true or not but i mean they need to they if they can stay out of jail and just and be con- and consistently put up content you know, that'd be great. You know, what's so funny is I have people in the comment section who are like, why don't you do all your stuff live? Okay. Well, do you know what the business model for live is? It's hard. Or n- not live. I, I mean like in person. Cause I do once a week, we do in person, uh, three times a week we do sh- uh stream yard. Do you know how hard that is? You got to pay a lot of stuff. You got to, well, f- first of all, I-, I don't pay anybody anything to come here. So that means, guess what? I have to convince you to fly yourself here, get a hotel room. That's on you. Because I can't pay to do that because I don't make enough money per video. That means that every time somebody came here, for me to interview people in person every time, I'd have to pay for almost all those people to fly them in, put them in a hotel. Maybe that video makes four or 500 bucks, but I'd have to spend 600 bucks to get you here. And I've also learned like another thing that I, I, and I know this cause I, I've been at the company twice. I worked for a big company and they, pro, they, they will do this. We'll do that. And before you find out, you find out within a couple of months that these companies aren't really going to do much more for you than you can already do for you. You just right. going to have to kind of figure it out. And I, I respect you because you've kind of done that. You figured out how to do something. You just did it. And you, again, you have to sell to someone, Hey, coming on this channel, will help you. 
you know, or, or, or it'll, it'll add something to, to what you're doing. And yeah, you can't pay people because you don't make enough. YouTube doesn't, well, I think people just believe like, oh, if you get a certain amount of views, you probably make a ton of money. You know, yeah. I did 8 million views on TikTok last month. You know how much I made? Not that much. Right. You know, it's, I mean, I think it was like 2,400 bucks. Like it's not that much. Right. For 8 million views. I mean, yeah, all people money. would be thinking, you may, would you make uh, 50, 80,000, a hundred thousand dollars? Are you insane? No. And, and I think, you know, you just have to kind of accept that you're going to be doing multiple things. You know, I still do sports betting content. I still do all sorts of stuff. And I think you just have to understand that you will like you and I are talking right now. Most people at five o'clock, they just go home, you know? And yeah, this, what you do, what I do, it's, it's definitely more easy than most jobs, but my life is irreparably changed. I can no longer, Matt, go to certain places because I, what I do for a living, they don't like what I do. They look down upon it. I, I can't, you know, I can't do certain things. And my life has changed a little bit, but I, I enjoy it. It's fun, you know, and you create stuff, you be creative and you figure out a way, you find a way. So, oh, yeah, it's, it's, um, Oh, I, I, I think it's super rewarding. You know, I, I think I mentioned one time that it, I equate it to mowing the yard. You ever mow your yard? Yeah. And when you're done mowing the yard, you've edged it, you've mowed, you've done this, you put yeah. it and you, you get to look back on your yard and you're like, nice. That was like, nice. like I did that. I, it's good. It's perfect. It gives you a feeling of accomplishment. And that's how you kind of feel when you put, when you finish a video and then and when the video out. does well, I think that's course, also, you better. know, that, you know, I've always said, I, this doesn't happen to me that many times, but on TikTok, I've had, I have four or five videos that have over a million views. And there's something about when you post a video and you see like in the first 10 minutes, you have 10,000 views. It's like, holy shit. Like this one's going to be a big one, you know, or on yeah. YouTube where, you know, I, you know, we're all pretty like stringent on what, what we look for. And it's, you know, when, you, when a video does well, it, it, you're right. It's like doing something and, and you, you achieve it and you think, wow, I did that, you know? And most people can't get a hundred views on a video. Right. Right. And it's like, I think that's something we also have to generalize and think about. It's like a lot, a lot of people can do that. So, you know, I'm proud of what I've done and I know you probably are as well. And I just try to keep moving forward, keep creating new shit, try to bring out new cool stories and if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't, as long as you watch it. So you're gonna you're gonna revamp and reapply your channel in a few in what two more? What do you got? Two more months? So the channel that I had previously does not make any money right now. Okay. Right. Um, I haven't posted any videos on it. When the channel is able to be monetized again, I'll probably reapply. If I get reapplied. I'll just make money off the evergreen views that I get on the videos. But no, I've 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 created something new and I'm going to build that up again and yeah, have both, oh. I guess, you know. Yeah. And go from there. But yeah, I think you just got to take a look and make sure you're doing everything and follows the rules and uh, you know, try to follow. It's a shame that you have to cuz censorship's so bad, but you have to just kind of uh make sure you're following the rules and if your content's good, people will watch it. Hopefully, unless you're shadow banned. Exactly. But I'm looking forward to speaking to you next week. All right. I will let you go. I know you only bracketed off a couple hours. I don't care. It's always fun. <laughs> we talked about all sorts of shit on here, man. So Yeah. Well, you know, what's so funny is like a video like this that I think I, I, I'm i like, yeah, it was all right. It, it, I don't know the, how well it's going to do because we kept got, getting off topic. You know who knows how well it'll do. It might. Uh, we have a couple of good. We have a couple of good segments there where we talked about you know Joey and Gene and yeah. you know. Well, and I, and I think and, and Colby will go through and he'll pull those yeah. and he'll create a little intro. And you know, you know, what I'm saying like it, it may be like th that intro. People b might be like, "Wow!" And they'll watch like the whole video, and then it'll take off. You just don't know. Well, I think here's how you know. And I'll end it with this: if you have a video full of. When, when you have a guest on and all their the guest is bad, like you, you'll have a bunch of bad comments about me because you either like me or you don't. Um, right. But I just think and realize, as you said earlier, like the comment counts the same, right? 
whether it's bad yeah, or it good. doesn't matter. It's, 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 it's exposure. It's, yeah. So uh, it is what it is. I've, I've been in media since 2009. Okay. I've done it a long time. I'm still pretty young. In my whole life, I've never had a negative experience doing this ever. No one's ever come up and, you know, you fucking scum. I've never had that, you know, and I think people, 90% of people are good people. They just like to watch the shit and that's it. You right. Know, and I'm not going to let the 5%, you know, if, if I did that, I wouldn't, oh, I wouldn't yeah, yeah. still be doing this. So it's a cesspool. You can't let it bother you. No, absolutely not. Uh-huh. But I'm sure it'll be good. I appreciate talking to you. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor and please consider joining my Patreon. Please hit the subscribe button if you haven't. And also hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Look in the description box because we're going to have the links to Jeff's channel and or to his new channel. And if he wants to the old one, we can put that one in there too. We'll figure that out. I really do appreciate you guys watching. Please leave me a comment. Please hit the like button or the dislike button. I appreciate it. See ya.